Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Katerina Adam, and on behalf of the organizing committee of the distance learning workshop, what is the new normal in distance learning in European universities, I would like to welcome you all. This workshop was organized by the University Alliance linking society and technology for sustainable futures. In order to enhance the participation of the attendees of this workshop. Till last night, we had almost 700 people registered in the event. The workshop is organized in the following manner. After this plenary introductory session, we are going to have three parallel panel discussions where representatives from all universities of the Alliance, academics, students, and IT experts are going to discuss on the opportunities and the challenges of distance learning in our days. The main conclusions of this discussion are going to be presented in the summary and conclusions by the moderators of each panel discussion. During the whole of this workshop, participants will have the opportunity to present their, their questions and answer to pollings that are going to be available during, as I said, the whole duration of the event. The event is going to be broadcasted online in the website of the workshop, as well as the YouTube channel of the National Technical University of Athens. For the participants who might be interested to receive a certificate of attendance, please identify so in the website of the workshop and you're going to be issued a certificate following the completion of the event. And again, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank you all for being with us today. And I would like to invite Professor Andreas Budubis, Director of the National Technical University of Athens to open the workshop. Professor Budubis, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you, Katerina. Dear colleagues, uh, teachers, students, university administrators from all over Europe. Uh, to my capacity as uh, the rector of the National Technical University of Athens, I welcome you all to uh, the European Workshop on Distance Learning. On behalf of the NTUA people who are involved in the organization of the workshop, I express our pleasure and honor to be the hosts of today's event. Uh, the workshop is organized by a European University Alliance established to serve the purpose of linking society and technology to shape sustainable future. 
Professor Christina von Haren, Vice President for International Affairs and Sustainability from Leibniz University in Hanover, will introduce our alliance. What is the new normal in distance learning in European universities? Uh, before we address this question, we need to understand and actually assess in qualitative and quantitative terms, our experience still ongoing with distance learning imposed by the pandemic. Uh, I taught undergraduate class in fluid mechanics in the School of uh, Chemical Engineering of NTUA for two semesters, one in the spring of last year and another this year. And in a few days, actually, I'm going to give an exam to a class of uh, more than 200 students. It will be a mixed exam. Uh, more students will take the exam in person and some from a distance. I have not seen my students for two consecutive years. I did not have the chance to interact with them with uh, physical discussion through body language, eye contact, and spontaneous reactions and automatic adaptation to circumstances and happenings that is the traditional normal in usual classroom teaching and laboratory training. Uh, I will not be able actually to recognize most of them when passing by in the building's corridors or the various campus places when the anti-pandemic measures are over. Uh, my colleagues, the teaching personnel in NTUA, as in many other places all over the world, rolled up their sleeves from day one and started Zooming, teaming, Webexing. And so did the students from the, under, from the other end of the line. And they did that with a lot of patience, determination, and great sense of responsibility. It was like we were all prepared to deal with an adverse and extremely demanding situation of the kind of the pandemic. And we did all these things while taking care of our own health and the health of our families and loved ones and those close to us, keeping social distance, dealing with lockdowns and obeying reduced mobility rules. Although education went digital, that was a one-way choice, there could not be but very limited virtual substitution of certain activities, such as hands-on laboratory training an engineering student has to go through. What are the consequences and limits of going digital? As far as mainly students, as well as teachers, strength limits, psychological and otherwise are concerned. How about learning outcomes, examinations integrity, implications on European student and staff mobility? One thing is for sure, that we feel that we have reached a point of saturation, even exhaustion. Uh, the pros and cons of distance learning will be the basis in shaping the new normal normality. Here are what some NTUA students had to say about some pros of remote education. I save at least two hours of travel and have more time to read. Uh, great viewing comfort. The blackboard looks perfect and does not depend on our seat in the auditorium. Those of us who have used to live away from our families uh, now live with them, saving effort and money. We are not late for class. We wake up later than before, a few minutes before the lesson starts, comfortable and relaxed, and do not experience any travel delays. And a last comment from the students. We do not miss lectures. Sometimes when we are pressed for time to complete the task, we may choose not to attend a virtual lecture, but we can return to it in an asynchronous way. Uh, what will be the mixture of digital and physical, remote versus in-person, as we progress with the anti-COVID measures, locally and globally? As I understand, the majority of the US universities are planning to go hybrid next fall with a stronger preference towards in-person teaching. Uh, that most likely will be the prevailing choice in Europe. In this virtual workshop, 
uh, academic educators and university students from the nine universities of our alliance will discuss distance learning as a new learning modality for social, technical, and pedagogical uh, perspectives. Our keynote speaker, Professor Pedro Luis Martinez, Vice Rector for Strategy and Digital University of Murquia in Spain, will address key issues of remote education in our era. Success stories and lessons learned in the COVID era will be started and uh, discussing and shared within panel discussions to identify advantages and opportunities for universities and work towards sustainable solutions for the European higher education area. Uh, before closing, my thanks to the NTUA team for the hard work regarding the preparation of this meeting, and in particular, the chair, Professor Katerina Adam, Professor Rihanna Rusaki, Antonia Labropoulou, Katerina Macrinou, and our virtual floor manager, Yanis Zigunakis, and our technical team, who will be under alert in the front and backstage for the duration of the event. And I also thank the rectors and the presidents of the Alliance for supporting our proposal to run this workshop, the study and education working group members, the moderator, the panelists, and the attendees. Let's go for a fruitful and vivid virtual conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Andreas Budvis. I would like now to invite Professor Christina von Haren, Vice President of International Affairs and Sustainability of the Leibniz University of Anovero to present to us the University Alliance Shape Linking Society and Technology for Sustainable Futures. Professor Haren, the floor is yours. Thank you, Katarina. Thank you, Andreas, uh, for this introduction. And um, thank you. I, I would like to join into the thanks which Andreas just um, gave to the team who organized this, because um, the the European University, which we the alliance, which we are forming right now, uh, is living of such initiatives and uh, such great devotion, which we experienced over the last weeks, especially from the NTUA team. And um, without this initiative, I think this wouldn't have happened today. Though the subject which you choose is, I think, extremely uh, pressing and also present in all our universities and all of us are talking about this. And um, uh, so this is an excellent example, I think, for the, for the um, possibilities and the potential which the European University uh, is un unleashing, I would say, which is present in all our universities. And let me also uh, link to what Andrea said, just said, the description of what happened in the NTUA, in the uh, NTU Athens, is exactly what we could transfer to Hanover, what we experienced here. And I'm sure also the other universities uh, and members um, and participants here can join in because that is something we now have to master in each university, but also we can better master that together. And it also opens a lot of potential for uh, joint teaching. The, the University Alliance, which we formed, consists of nine universities and um, it's, a, it's a very interesting and very um, a, a mixture with a lot of potential consisting of universities with a, with a focus on technical affairs and uh, of universities which uh, are kind of mixed like uh, Hanover University, but also of universities which have an, a more society, society, uh, society social science and humanities focus. So um, these nine universities have united in the mission to link as a subject, to link society and technology and advances in society and technology uh, and to create 
a more sustainable future. The European University linking surf, uh, science and technology um, with the acronym ULIS we use um, is of course inspired by the European uh, Universities program. We started um, writing a proposal to submit to the EU. Now this has been postponed, but nevertheless, you can see that all the universities we brought together here, um, they are very devoted and said, okay, let's do this nevertheless, because there is an added value, a benefit for all of us in this endeavor, in this activity. Next slide, please. So something which, is, which also has been mentioned by Andreas is that universities are in our, in the, in the regions or in the societies in which we are embedded are some, something special. I was also very impressed to see how this intrinsic motivations of the university members um, enabled us to switch from one day to another almost to distance learning last year. And uh, now we have a lot of experience, but at that time we did not. And this, nevertheless, this happened almost in the blink of an eye. And everybody, the students, the teachers, administration work together in a very engaged way. And this is something which is, I think, indeed something which is special and a potential which we can draw on and which when we bring this together in an alliance of several universities, we enlarge our potential in many ways. And this wonderful conference here about this very timely subject is one example, I think, for what joining strength can um, result in so that we really, we can uh, work with uh, shared labor. Uh, one party does this, the other that. And nevertheless, uh, we can offer our students a great educational program, which is not only, uh, not only fed by our own university, but we join our, our strength and our excellency. We said our one, or our central theme will be to work in the field how society and technology interact sustainably under the premise of the SDGs, the sustainable, uh, the, the um, development goals for the world, sustainable development goals for the world. And we will start with a kind of um, selection, but nevertheless, we are following, every university can follow the, uh, what they choose, but nevertheless, we found that we have uh, an, a kind of uh, overlap, especially in quality education. And this first event here is an example for that in clean renewable energies, in uh, industry innovation, and in sustainable cities and communities. Next slide, please. The, our objectives are to join the strategies and um, for teaching, research, and outreach. And uh, a core objective of all of us is innovative teaching formats, innovating learning formats, and uh, we want to offer our students a seamless mobility between the partner universities. And this will grow step by step. We are happy that we ha will have some time, but we ha also have a great uh, advantage now because we have the, uh, the, the experiences of the pandemic time, and we will see what will come out of that, the mixing uh, physical and digital mobility in a hybrid and, and very clever way. Then another, uh, another goal of uh, the network is that we want to create an inter-university green campus, joining our best practice uh, examples from the different universities, developing the campuses everywhere 
in the in the uh, alliance and also maybe um, showing to the regions showing to the society what a university can achieve in this respect and uh, finally of course we want to be drivers into the regions in which we are embedded with our um, uh, single universities but but also as a network and uh, work there as a, as a driver of development but also um, supporting networking of science society in the regions and with um, uh, societal institutions. So that is our vision. And um, this conference here is a very good start. I think we have several projects which we <laughs> try to realize right now, but I'm very happy that we start here with, a, with this uh, really great teaching initiative and I'm really grateful to TU Athens that they started this initiative and also uh, organized it so excellently in, and I must say in a very short time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So also organize different, joining also different organizing cultures, I think brings, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know whether the Germans would have been so fast. Uh, so joining the different organizing cultures is already, I think, an added value we, which we can harvest right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Haren. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, with this uh, opportunity, we would like to invite our keynote speaker, Professor Martinez, Vice Rector for Strategy and Digital University from the University of Murcia, to give us his keynote speech, a strategic view on the future of higher education online teaching. Professor Martinez, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure uh, being here, sharing with you uh, views and probably generating more questions than answers uh, on this very interesting uh, topic idea that you have selected. I think it's a very good opportunity for a great consortium uh, to reflect and think about what's the future of uh, online learning uh, in the European arena. In this regard, uh, I've been reflecting on several stages, which is uh, what happened with COVID-19 to what we were already doing. And then we have a little uh, view on what could be the possible futures uh, on how online teaching and learning can evolve in, in our European arena. The reality is that, I mean, uh, universities were already facing digital transformation before COVID-19. And for most of us, we were all thinking on new ways to make the most of technology in order to uh, increase the competitiveness of our institutions. And uh, the reality is that technology opens up a lot of new opportunities especially in whatever is related to teaching and learning. However, there are a lot of different challenges that higher education is gonna to have to face in this decade. And in fact, many of those uh, challenges already remain, uh, not only before COVID, but also in post COVID. And in that sense, uh, we were already working and thinking on how to adapt our institutions and uh, our business models to this new reality that was about to come. Uh, things like personalized learning, like long life learning, digital credentials, or even data or learning analytics were already here before the pandemic. But the reality is that when the pandemic suddenly appears, of course, creates a strong disruption. And then we need to move faster than we were moving. We were taking this like some possible future. And then we realized that it's not a possible future. It's a reality which is already here. And I think in higher education institutions, we will have like three different phases uh, on how we will approach 
uh, learning and teaching. The first phase was basically learning continuity, trying to continue our, uh, teaching and learning activities with the help of technology and uh, in a, an emergency situation. Phase two, to me, is basically when what did happen after the first uh, severe, severe di disruption when we enter into uh, the preparation of the current course, 2020, 2021. Uh, most of universities we were trying to introduce some uh, novelties, improve our tools, and basically uh, incorporate the lessons learned during the first phase. And finally, there is the phase three, which I think is still about to come, which is what's going to be this new normal, and what will be the future that we will have to face, and how can we evolve all the effort we've been doing into making our institutions prepare for such future. In that sense, in phase one, I think more or less all universities have uh, suffered the same situation. And we've been doing a lot of effort to move our classes online or uh, LMS is, I mean, the uh, virtual campuses experience a very huge increase in use. We've been basically relying on bioconferencing to uh, basically uh, continue doing uh, synchronous instruction. Uh, this actually allowed us, allowed us to, to like really have a, a fast reaction to the, to the pandemic. Uh, but we all recognize that probably that was not the best uh, model and we were more in doing some kind of emergency uh, response teaching than uh, really an online learning. So for, for the second phase, I think, again, the most heard keyword, or I would say now even buzzword, is hybrid learning. And I think, you know, most universities, we've been working on improving our basic uh, technological tools. We've been uh, introducing multimedia into all of our retro uh, rooms. Uh, we've been offering our teachers or faculty uh, a whole new bunch of utilities they can use to enhance the experience of, the, of, the, of their teaching and learning, uh, increasing interactivity. And uh, of course, uh, we've been also uh, basically help them improve their capabilities and, their, and make them digital enable, uh, enable it, uh, so that they can uh, adapt their activities and uh, to the, the new possibilities that they could be using in this course. And this is how I think we have been transitioned for, through these two uh, main uh, phases. Now I would, I would like to ask you uh, to follow this link <clears throat> And let's do a, a small poll about what's your initial feeling about uh, the preparedness of your institution for uh, online learning and teaching in the, in the years to come. So uh, if you follow this link, you will be able to enter into this uh, online poll. And I will ask you, I will wait a, a minute uh, so that you can uh, introduce your answers and then, and then I will comment a little bit on this uh, first perception on how prepared we feel we are for uh, online learning. Okay, some answers are already getting in. Okay, there's still a lot of people answering, so I will wait a little bit more. OK. 
Okay. Last 30 seconds. Okay, time to show the results. So let me, sorry. So at the moment, uh, I'm sorry, I had to change my screen so that you can see the results. Okay, so I so sorry, I have a problem with permissions. So I will directly tell you the, the results. Uh, okay. So at the moment, the results are as follows. 10% uh, of participants uh, think that mm, their institution is very well prepared and no further investments are needed. 54% uh, uh, feel that they are very well prepared, but uh, they still need to improve the capabilities of their faculty. This is the most voted uh, option. Uh, then at 22%, which is the second option, uh feels that the faculty is very well prepared but uh, they are lacking like technical capabilities they need more tools and 15 percent thinks that they lack important capabilities both technologically and front of faculty uh, none of the respondents uh feel that they are not prepared at all for to offer online learning I think that's more or less a like what I would expect to be a natural result in the sense that we have done a lot of effort to improve our capabilities due to this more than one year. And in reality, I think we have done a very good effort and we have improved quite a lot. The thing is, if the offer we are already doing is good enough to be competitive in the future. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the future later on so that we can think if probably we still keep our opinion or we change it. But the thing is that uh, many people has confused this remote emergency teaching with online learning and they are basically not the same. So in some cases, even though experience may not be the best, uh, that doesn't mean that online must be worse than on premises or, or vice versa. I mean, they are just orthogonal questions. So in that sense, what is important is to know where we are in terms of maturity for online learning. And, you know, having an establishing an strategic approach to improving our position. So in that regard, for instance, this is the case for University of Murcia. Mm, our main goal is not to be or to become a fully online uh, university, but we have improved a little bit during the, during the pandemic uh, in some of the different areas of online learning maturity. But we can see here that, that we are still not quite mature in some others. So for instance, in our case, I wouldn't say that we are uh, very well prepared or that we have no investments to, to be done. I think probably we still need to do something better. And in particular, it's important that the senior leadership of the institution uh, work in preparing an online learning strategy. That's very, very important because that avoids what is called usually in the States, this uh, dins gone wild, which is that uh, each of the different faculties start going online in a different way without a comparable uh, tools, etc. So it's like uh, no organization into online education. So in that sense, that's very important. And in particular, 
what is very important when, de when defining such strategic such strategy is uh, to consider uh, the different aspects related with online learning. Of course, we have to have a clear view on where we want to go. That's our strategic goals. But we need to match those strategic goals with our technical agility. I mean, with our ability for our, for our tools to adapt to the requirements of future online. And we have to clearly see if we have enough funding and enough resources to create a competitive uh, technology package that can help people. And, and then that's the third aspect, people agility. I mean, uh, is or have faculty prepared? Are we able to prepare them to these new models of education? That's going to be definitely one of the uh, uh, another possible limiting factor on our online learning ambition as an institution. And of course, we need to measure if we are really matching or achieving our goals. And if our offers actually are competitive to what a student may find in the market. And uh, I see, I mean, these terms are not quite used in, in universities like market, market business proposition and things like that. But the reality is that many people think that we are now under, under disruption. And basically one of the things that's gonna happen is productification of online learning. So we have to think on products, on things that get uh, better and better over time and matches the, uh, what or uses basically students expect. So we have to make ourselves the key questions. And it's important to find the right balance between providing a very good solid online experience for all of our teachers in an easy way so that they, they do not need to, to do a, a lot of effort. And this is what we call working on foundation. And probably 80% of our funding should be uh, focused on this foundation, on our LMS and creating easy but very good templates for our professors to move their, their courses online, et cetera. And at the same time, allowing those staff who wants to go further who wants to innovate in their teaching and learning to also be able to experiment and, and, and evolve. And the idea is basically creating this continuous cycle of increased improvement. So when we think about phase three, the probably most uh, referred word I have found in the literature is uncertainty. Nobody is clear on what's gonna be the future especially in the long term. And in this case, I mean, we were already thinking, at least the people who work on strategy, like in my case, on what is to post or what our university wanted to be in 2030, for instance. And the possible scenarios depends very much on what's gonna happen with the uh, validity or uh, importance of formal credentials versus micro credentials and informal ones and also how technology in particular and tele artificial intelligence is going to be disrupting more or less or institutions and that creates like this quadrant in which you might find that it's better to be positioned or and, and you can then know exactly what to plan for but the problem now is that we have faced a disruption within a, disrupt a disruption. I mean, COVID-19 has come over in the middle of this disruption. So what are those, those scenarios? It's not so clear any, anymore, because in particular, we need to guarantee that what, whatever investments we do for this new normal, like 2022, 2023, actually do pay off in our overall strategy towards 2030. So, here comes another question for you, which is, uh, what is your vision about how it's going to be this new normal compared with pre-COVID in terms of what's going to be or what's going to happen with online activities versus face-to-face uh, -face in class activities? And again, we will wait for one minute or so for for you to answer.
Okay, we have a lot of input at the moment. So uh, I will wait just say 30 more seconds for those of you who haven't answered yet. But uh, at, at the moment we have a very large participation in the poll. Okay, here we go. So at the moment, the winning option is uh, those of you who think that online activities will grow and face-to-face -face classes will be reinvented for greater value. This is, this at the moment has like 57% of the votes. And the second option, uh, it's online learning activities will grow and face-to-face -face classes will reduce. The other two activities, like online activities exponentially growing and face-to-face -face classes almost disappearing, only has a 4% people thinking that's going to be the future scenario. And that both uh, online learning and face-to-face -face classes will go back exactly to where it was in pre-COVID values, uh, have a 14% of support. So uh, I think that represents pretty much what is also the feeling I think in my university at the moment. I think there are still some people who think that things may probably go back to where we were, but most of us think that actually things has changed and they're not going to be back to where it was exactly or teaching and learning and things are going to change. And those are basically the, more, the, the, the two possible options people are thinking. Increase online learning uh, with reduction in face-to-face -face. and most people I think at the moment at, also at my university thinks that face-to-face -face classes is going to still be there and they are going to be reinvented and this is probably the same opinion I personally have. I think that uh, presenciality is very a very interesting asset that many universities at least face-to-face -face universities have and we shouldn't actually uh, just uh, uh, get rid of that. That's a, 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 an important aspect that can help improve our uh, value proposition. But of course, presenciality has to provide something valuable. I mean, why do I make the effort to uh, get up early and basically uh, go there to, to the classroom if what you are giving me is basically something I can see on, on a video anytime, anywhere? So I, I, I expect something else. I think our students is gonna expect something else. So uh, what I've seen, at least in our institute, in, in University of Murcia, is that uh, teachers have done, I mean, faculty has, has done a very tremendous effort in using all the new tools and putting forward this hybrid model. And we've seen that, that 22% of our teaching staff is basically moved to fully online. The other 78 is be basically using hybrid learning from the classroom. And we've seen that things uh, are changing. If we compare what it would be from the middle of the graph to the left, which is basically previous year, fast response with phase two, which is from the middle of the graph to the right. We can see, for instance, that professors are adopting very good practices. They are moving online, but they have created online content, enriched content, interactive content. And this is something that was basically never used or rarely used by your teachers before. And now they had the options to go back to hybrid and forget about this additional effort, but they are doing it because they find it useful and relevant. And the same happens with continuous assessment. We have seen an increase in the way in which uh, our students have been assessed. And we are using um, uh, continuous assessment more than ever. And even with the exam tools, even though we are now doing our exams uh, in a face-to-face -face manner, this year alone, we have been having still a very huge use of this remote examination tool 
but basically in order to do this formative assessment i mean uh, continuously giving feedback to the students on how they are progressing and that's very important this is these are like very good practices that our people are doing so this is why i'm very convinced on at least that's my opinion that we're not going to be back to the baseline after the, the, the new normal, but we're probably reinventing what's going to be our model in the sense that we will move more activities to online, especially those that have more value when they are delivered online, like content, like the mini videos, uh, etc. But we all will also reinvent and this is the a green line, the face-to-face uh, -face class. And we will be aiming at much better experiences and, and taking face-to-face uh, uh, -face classes together uh, with our students to improve their, their, uh, their learning. So in that regard, how it's gonna be, and this is the last part of the talk, how it's gonna be uh, online teaching and learning in the future? So basically we can take some decisions ourselves, but we must accept, we, we must accept that there are some important driving forces and global trends that's gonna influence a lot of, of uh, on higher education institutions. And probably we won't be able to make all the free um, or, or decide ourselves the model of the new normal. Probably that's gonna be imposed by, by the reality. So it's clear that higher education was already being disrupted before. And the COVID-19 has basically accelerated quite a lot or requirement on dealing with those uh, things that were already uh, being pointed out by students, by faculty, and that the tools uh, and technology can help a lot to improve uh, the value proposition of universities. But there are things that are not going to change after the pandemics. For instance, there's going to be a very high impact of technology in the labor market, and that will basically increase the demands of reskilling and upskilling of professionals. In fact, some studies say that for 2030 and 2040, there will be more relearners and reskillers than. Uh, first course uh, students or students doing their first studies. And this is something congruent about in, in different studies. And we expect an exponential growth in demand. So if this demand in the skilling and skilling is gonna be uh, tackled by universities, of course we need to move online because this kind of learners, of course, have very specific needs that can be basically match in face-to-face uh, -face, uh, learning. Again, the current model doesn't, does not scale in terms of cost and quality. If, if the demand increases, that's a, that what's gonna happen is that our cost is also going to grow and probably our quality is gonna go down with the current model. So we, we're gonna be forced to change our model. And changing our model, it's gonna be basically trying to give answers to this unsatisfied demand. And that means basically converting our current model into a golden triangle in which we can scale, I mean, increase the number of students because there's gonna be huge demand, but not compromising cost and quality. And this can only be done with technology. And technology is gonna be basically our main asset. And we will already seen a important advances in technology in, in things like digital credentials, adaptive learning platforms, uh, artificial intelligence, etc. That's going to be a changing uh, asset in the future of education. And some institutions are already working on that. For instance, uh, University of Central Florida already has made a very big effort in transitioning from analog to digital. And they've managed basically to uh, triple the number of students in, 
and basically lowering the cost so that more students from minority groups are getting into university and at the same time being able to maintain a very nice uh, quality instruction, even though it's online. And in that sense, they manage to change the model and to convert this uh, triangle into a golden one. In particular, it's been really very relevant of what they're doing, which is uh, increasing these online and mixed models by 47%. And currently, 47% of their student credit hours are already designed in digital, digital first. And key for that is basically this circle, this virtual circle I was mentioning before. The idea of having a center which is helping the whole institution in this transition. It's like the digital transformation of the learning in which they develop our uh, faculty, they help with the design of courses, they help with the production, and at the end, you manage to reinvent and recreate and continually improve the quality of your online learning. So this means that if it, uh, universities have something to do and universities have the power to embrace online learning. However, the future is not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy because, of course, the trends are still continuing in the sense that we are in the middle of a disruption and there's going to be important changes that we're going to have to face. And universities are not particularly good at changing fast. And in some situations, Car, uh, digital transformation in the high institution in the higher education at the moment is the second sector in which a uh, most acceleration has been produced only after bank so in that in that sense we need to be realized that the future of this online learning is going to be point number one enabled by technology i mean technology is going to be the only way we will have uh, to be competitive and to provide quality learning and creating this golden triangle. And this is basically uh, admitted, and this is basically the main conclusion on, of many reports on trends. And we, we see basically the same technologies like artificial intelligence, learning analytics, micro credentials, open educational resources. So uh, definitely technology is something we have to embrace if we want to be successful in online learning. The second uh, aspect to consider is there's gonna be an increased competition because basically when you move online, students can study anywhere, any place. So competition is global, it's no longer local. So if your value proposition is not good enough, then you might suffer and not be competitive and successful in online learning. And of course, at the moment, there is this Saudi education sector and we see many companies entering into this higher education because they have seen clearly from my previous graphs that there's a, a huge demand and there's gonna be this huge demand for reskilling and skilling. So if universities want to be uh, key players in that arena, then we will need to compete with this other new guys in the block. And of course, uh, that means that things that at the moment we do not pay much attention so far, like market, marketing and, and data analytics is gonna be very, very relevant. For instance, uh, Southern New Hampshire University, which is the second in the United States with more online uh, students, invests, invests uh, yearly 139 million in marketing in order to be competitive with some other of some this, of these other MOOC offers like Coursera, Udemy, et cetera. I don't know your institutions, but for sure in the University of Murcia, we cannot spend such amount of money for marketing because basically we will have to uh, stop even getting electricity. So uh, in that sense, uh, that's a huge cha change. You want to be competitive there, you have to be prepared 
for what is coming. And this coming is also huge disruption in the sense that uh, mm, this remembers me to the 21st century when we have these companies in entertainment sector that mm, they, they were living very happy and they were looking at Amazon, Netflix, YouTube and things that they, they, they were not worried at all. I remember there was this uh, guy from the uh, music industry that said, MP3, who's going to listen that crap? The reality is that uh, all those leader contenders has completely changed the way in which a enter entertainment market has evolved. And we have seen basically the same behaviors now in academy. And we look in at Khan Academy, Cargo, EDX, and we think, well, these are not really substitutes of the real thing, of course. Uh, we cannot imagine our employers hiring someone who doesn't have one of our respective degrees. This might happen, definitely, and disruption happens very fast. So uh, factor number three, student experience. Uh, we have seen with the pandemic, uh, in the first two weeks, students we were very happy because we were continuing our education uh, very fast. For the next year, they wanted more. Because that was just an emergency, emergency uh, response. That's gonna be, I mean, student expectation, expectations can only grow. So, Petro, Petro yes. uh, excuse me, allow me, because we are running out of time. Oh, sorry. And, uh, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you because really uh, all, uh, all your ideas, but I would like to ask you to wrap up if we want to be able to answer some of the questions posed by the audience, in addition to the pollings you have conducted already. So if you could please wrap up. Uh, Definitely. Thank you very much for, yes. for advising me. I, I completely forgot about time. Yes, I was uh, sending okay, you messages. So that's going to be basically this uh, idea of we are going to be adaptive learning. People uh, learn at different rates and institutions need to be adaptive as well if we want to be competitive. And finally, there's going to be a huge demand for flexible pathways accredited by micro credentials. Uh, just to mention that in Europe, we are in a very good position and alliances like yours has a very good opportunity in using Europass and EPSI as a base infrastructure to allow recognition between institutions. So basically, uh, summing it up, we are basically in a point of string disruption, and we are also in a pivotal point for higher education. This decade is going to be like an inflection point for higher education that it can create the, the, a very a string gap between institutions that really approach online learning strategically and plan ahead and those who don't. So it's important now, especially with a, 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 a assistance funds from the European Union to make a very strategic investment of all those funds so that we can continue being competitive in the near future. And this is all from my side, sorry for, uh, uh, sending my time and of course uh, I'm glad to uh, receive any question from your side. Uh, thank you very much Pedro, really thank you very much because this was an exciting presentation and uh, from, uh, from what you presented I kept three, three numbers but four percent believes that the physical courses are going to be extinguished but 14 percent believe that uh, uh, we are going to return back to normal and most of the people really believe that it's going to be a hybrid type of education where technology needs to assist. Uh, thank you very much, really. There is a number of questions uh, that uh, from the audience that I would like to, to give and uh, one of them can be answered. One of, my, of them is, directly, is directed to you. It says, uh, Agnieszka, says very inspiring speech. So many open lines are ahead of us. In general sense, in your opinion, what are the most important competencies a teacher must develop? Open-mindedness, technology skills, cultural sensitivity. This is a question that can be answered by Pedro, but by all the panelists uh, of the plenary session, of course, as well. So 
We have six minutes to answer questions, um, including the break. So please. <laughs> Okay, uh, I will be fast so, so, uh, just to leave some time for other, others uh, in case they want to answer. So, uh, of course, we have to be technologically enabled. Uh, that's clear because technology is going to play an important role, but technology is not going to be the most important part. Most important part is about methodology and how to engage students and how to make the most of the teaching time. Okay, uh, Professor Budovis, would you like to add something to that or Professor Haren? Uh, no, I think that the essence of the uh, of the uh, of the theme was uh, completely covered by uh, Pedro, uh, but there are some other associated questions, and I have provided mm -hmm. some uh, responses mm -hmm. during the uh, Pedro's talk. Uh, I don't know if if you have any priority in uh, um, presenting the questions, uh, Katerina. No, I'll, I'll just stick to the unanswered questions because really we have run out of time and in five minutes we have to move to the panel. So I'll go to the second question that remains unanswered. I think that it will be interesting to see what the long-term impact will be. How much will virtual exchange and remote work be used? Will blended learning not only be a remedy in times of social distancing by a means for more flexible and better quality learning? How will the experience of the crisis shape joint research and enhance open access? Actually, it's a question with three legs, so I'm going to repeat it. Um, how much will virtual exchange and, and remote work be used? Will blended learning not only be a remedy in times of social distancing, but a means for more flexible and better quality learning? How will the experience of the crisis shape joint research and enhance open access? Uh, may I comment on, uh, on two and three, just mm -hmm. very briefly? Well, the answer is provided within the question. It will be a means for more flexible and better quality learning, that's for sure. And uh, regarding number three, uh, the crisis, the crisis uh, effect on uh, joint research and enhanced open access, certainly yes. I think we have already seen some very strong signals that uh, this is uh, the direction that we are moving. Okay. Uh, I don't know if uh, Pedro or Christina would like to add something to this question. From my side, I totally agree with uh, Professor Andreas. And uh, for the first question on how much will virtual exchanges and remote work be used, uh, actually, that's a very tough question. I'm not sure I have an answer for that, but I think definitely uh, my vision is that we are going to try to make the best of presenciality at all times and uh, for everything else we can do successfully without physical presence, probably we will prefer the anytime, anywhere paradigm as we're seeing in things mm -hmm. like Netflix and things like that. Actually, there are two questions that are very interesting, and I believe that it's worth uh, presenting them. Um, is it really possible to do any hands-on laboratory activities via the distance learning way? It's one question. And the second is, uh, yes, technology is important, but how can distance learning be used efficiently in the case of artistic teaching, for example, in teaching dance in higher education? So. Uh, Every, anybody from the panelists that would like to answer to these questions, the one refers to laboratory activity, hands-on laboratory activities, and the second to artistic, artistic teaching, emphasis placing in teaching dance. Virtual Maybe reality, yeah. virtual reality, augmented reality is the way to go. Of course, there are other prerequisites for that. Regarding the last question about dancing, I have seen many people doing Pilates over the uh, internet for the last uh, six months. I think Christina wanted to add something on that. Am I right in saying so? <laughs> yes, I think that uh, like a pilot uh, is also learning some skills on a, on a kind of virtual stirring board. Uh, also laboratory things can be done partly um, or will be done partly also on a digital basis, but not completely. We, I think I'm, I'm really convinced that we need both. We need the <coughs> physical presence 
in the classroom and the physical interaction of, uh, somehow of the, the bodies or whatever. And uh, we need the digital support and pre preparation. I think preparation of the physical encounter is, is a very important thing. And um, I experienced myself that uh, online dancing course can is something else, but it's also very valuable. Um, I, I had an online dancing course <laughs> over this last year and, and I learned things which I wouldn't have learned, I think, um, in the usual dancing course. So, so I think also there the mixture makes the good recipe and the mixture will be different in different disciplines and different um, lessons, types of lessons. A lot. All this really, it is really exciting and, and it's not only for us, I think it's for all the attendees that are approximately 300 from what uh, our team tells me, but I really have to stop and I uh, strongly recommend and I strongly urge all the participants to put the questions that did not have the time to be answered to the panel discussions they are going to participate. I would like to thank a lot, uh, Professor Karen, uh, Professor Ruiz Martinez for this exciting keynote speech and uh, our host, uh, our rector, Professor Andreas Budubis, and invite us all in the panel discussion starting as we speak. So let's continue. Thank you, Katarina, and thank you also, Pedro. This was a very strategic, very good talk, I think. I learned a lot. Thank you. All of us. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much to you all. Thank you. Hello, I'm Julia, um, Julia Gillen for, from Leibniz University of Hannover. Again, I'm the moderator of this panel and um, I have the pleasure to work with six panelists. Um, and I like to um, first introduce them. And then we have two questions uh, we have to work with. And I will, um, we will start with the fir first question and all of the panelists will say something um, to this question. And in the second step, we do it with a second question. Okay. Um, so we can work with some, um, Doc, uh, someone from Bratislava, Dr. Radoslav Vajic. Vajic. Perhaps Vajic you have is okay. Vajic. <laughs> Hello, Radoslav. Hello. I'm happy that you're here. You come from the Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Information Technology from Bratislava. That's right. Um, welcome here in our panel. Then we have Christos Makropoulos. Uh, he comes from the School of Civil Engineering. Um, from the University of Athens. Hello, Christos. Uh, then we have Andreas Körner. He's senior scientist of mathematics in simulation and education. He comes from the University of Wien or Vienna. Um, then we have Mariana Kareinen. Uh, she comes from, she's an educational technology manager and comes from the University of La Penranta. And then we hello, have hello everyone. <laughs> hello. <laughs> then we have Brenda. Oh, oh, the Chisner Zalaza Lama. <laughs> Perhaps you can say your own name better than me. Um, you are undergraduate undergraduate student from the University of Madrid. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Brenda. Uh, and then we have Rosa Talala. She's also undergraduate student, but she comes from the University of La Penranta. Hello, Rosa. Hello. So now we have all of our six panelists um, with a small, uh, introduced with name and uh, the university where you come from. And um, in our panel, we have to talk about two questions. The first question, all of the panelists know the question is, which are the key opportunities, strengths, or advantages you identified during the distance learning period? 
So perhaps we we start uh, in this first um, session with uh, Radoslav again, and in the second session uh, we start with the students. So Radoslav, can you <clears throat> say us some comments to this question? Okay, uh, let's start with the first one. So opportunities, strengths, and advantages that I have identified. So the I think the opportunity, thanks to COVID, is now unique. Uh, never before it was so suitable condition to start and continue with uh, distance learning with much bigger extent than now. So uh, I, I believe uh, now is the good uh, opportunity. And also, it, it was, it was uh, this uh, pool previously, I, I believe that online activities will grow face to face, classes will be, will be reinvented to greater value. So we will somehow cooperate with the traditional approach. And what is strength, what was maybe not mentioned here, uh, that we are living in the digital transformation. So for the distance learning, uh, let's say a good, think is that all uh, teaching uh, materials are in digital form or is uh, just prerequisite and this uh, transformation has to happen so and this is also ongoing process and for distant learning i think is essential because uh, for uh, distant learning to be executed the teaching materials and also the teaching process should uh, be in harmony but this uh, teaching, let's say, uh, digital digital um, materials should be available. And we also have a shorter time to market now to um, make a good textbook or the material. So this is strength, I think, of this process to continue and to, to be uh, really deployed, say, in a greater extent and to, to remain. Uh, so, and better availability, of course, of the students, teachers, in case what something happens, uh, maybe in form a flexible time schedule, maybe recording of the process. So, great flexibility. What I think, maybe this is the, already the second question, what are the challenges and weaknesses? I think uh, the examination process is... Uh, huge weakness of all of this because it's hard to in big quantities of students to perform it uh, let's say with the exact the same quality like face to face and also this digital transformation of these all multimedia documents and materials storage copyright uh, it's maybe really challenging i i would say and that, that's my answer to these questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Radoslav. Um, and you, you go, g gave us, us both um, answers for the first uh, and the second was very good. Yes. And perhaps we, we continue in this way so every um, panelist can answer both of the questions be because it is, um, for me, it seems to be connected um, because you can say that is a positive and that is a negative. And um, yes, very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, even your view to the assessments and our uh, problems with the assessment and exams. Thank you. Okay, um, so we, we continue uh, in this way and um, all of the um, people who are participating can write some comments or questions in the chat. Um, my colleague uh, Markus Hoppe and um, Francesca Cristaldi will make a summary or will, uh, will write some uh, your questions down so we can moderate it in the well um, way. Okay, Christos uh, from Athens, do, do you like to answer the both, both questions? Thank you very much, Radoslav. Sure. So um, I'll start with the opportunities. Um, I think something that um, perhaps we all knew was possible in principle, uh, but we didn't really engage with until last year, these things scale. Um, and last year served as a bit of an eye opener, if you like, 
was how easy it is um, to engage uh, lecturers from abroad and also how easy it is to participate in as lecturers uh, in, uh, in lectures and modules and uh, seminars uh, hosted in universities abroad, uh, both as an academic, uh, but also as a student. So uh, in the past year, we had uh, you know, guest lecturers from the UK, from the US. Uh, we ourselves gave invited lecturers abroad. So I, I taught in Trondheim and in Delft. Um, our postgraduate students attended online summer courses, albeit not very um, with no real mobility, and uh, specialized lecture series um, in Milano, uh, in Berlin, uh, with, with really no cost to all parties. Now, I, I don't uh, mean to say that there is no um, um, uh, benefit to actual mobility. That's not what I'm saying. There is. Uh, but I think these digital opportunities uh, could act as a multiplier of opportunities for such, let's say, university collaboration across borders, um, uh, and uh, I think this is a huge opportunity uh, to co-organize, uh, you know, lecture series, uh, possibly even uh, co-teach uh, MSc degrees uh, attended and taught by students and academics from different universities, such as this uh, uh, this network, for example. Um, and I contrast this to um, uh, experience we had in NTUA in the past of running degrees together with other universities. We had a, an MSc degree in water with the University of Belgrade uh, for several years. But, but really, the technology was simply not mature enough for the seamless exchange, this digital presence. And I think this is a major one. It's a huge opportunity for this, uh, for this type of collaboration um, between universities. Um, it really opens up uh, the, the ability uh, for students to engage with uh, top academics um, uh, around the world and, and vice versa, of course, um, without really, um, uh, you know, seamlessly into, the, into their work life. So I think this is, this is a big one. Um, um, uh, there are a, another, a number of other specific benefits that we, we bumped into. Um, so, for example, it became very quickly apparent that the, the digital classroom uh, was actually more fit for specific types of lectures that we would otherwise um, teach traditionally. So, for example, uh, software tutorials, eh? um, uh, tutorials where we, uh, we used PC labs eh? anyway. Uh, so, um, so in this case, uh, it's much easier to interact with the, the, um, uh, the students. It's much easier for the students to see my screen, if you like, or for uh, myself to look at code that they've written and, and correct it rather than move around in a physical classroom. The other thing that was uh, what was really beneficial, I thought, and this uh, this is actually very, very similar to the point that uh, Radoslav uh, made earlier on, is that uh, we were, of course, able to now record lectures and that was beneficial for students because, of course, they, they could uh, go through the material again at their own time and never miss a, a, a lecture, as, uh, as Professor Budovis mentioned. Uh, but also, it was very beneficial for the lecture team eh? because it enhanced uh, continuity and consistency. Uh, so I was able, for example, to, uh, to really see uh, what uh, other colleagues did at earlier parts of the module and co-teaching with others so that I can link uh, you know, my teaching to specific things that they mentioned and say, well, actually, you remember uh, Andrea said this and that, and, and you know, I, I could build on that in a way that was simply not possible before. I couldn't really participate in all of the lectures of, of the other um, uh, teachers. Um, I also, I think we also appreciated the additional interactivity allowed with, um, you know, through polls and things like that. Um, they were available before, certainly, even in formal classroom settings, but we we um, um, uh, drove up a learning curve, if you like. Um, and I think this, this type of learning curve of using this, experimenting with this uh, polls and uh, interactive material was a, was a very positive thing. Uh, it improved our digital literacy. Actually, our students already knew uh, everything about them. Um, and, and I think it also, um, let's say, increased the acceptance of this digital form or the digital part of education, uh, it's not the whole story, eh? digital education, but this digital part, um, it, it, the acceptance and legitimization, I would say, uh, both in the minds of um, our colleagues, but also university uh, administrations. Um, so, so I think that that is positive, uh, and I think uh, the challenge here uh, would be to, um, you know, in a post-COVID, if you like, uh, education landscape is to, to cherry pick what worked from the digital world, um, blend it with face-to-face -face courses. Um, so I think that's a challenge, but a, a positive one. 
Um, so this is the positive side. Uh, the question is, do you want me to uh, to continue with challenges or, yeah. or perhaps? Yeah, okay. continue. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. So um, I think there, there were two major challenges, I would say. Well, many, but uh, two were the most important in my mind. So the uh, the first is uh, was actually mentioned early on by uh, by Andres Bodovis, this issue of engagement uh, between uh, and interaction between students and teachers. Uh, and the second was exams, uh, which Radoslav also uh, mentioned. So I don't think that exams were the biggest problem, but it was the biggest problem mm -hmm. in this year that we faced, of course. Um, but uh, but I'll just I'll just discuss it and get it out of it, the elephant in the room. So I think it's fair to say that we didn't manage to guarantee. Uh, fair exams in the past year. We did our best. Everybody did our best. Students, staff, uh, administration. But um, you know, there's there's a lot uh, a lot to go. I think we adapted very fast, as as was mentioned earlier on. But I have to say that our students adapted faster. Um, and privacy concerns also played a role here. Um, I would say in a bit of an exaggerated form, but still uh, I recognize concerns of privacy. Um, and I have to say, no, no good solution in terms of exams emerged the past year. We did switch to project work and oral exams, and this is fine uh, for postgraduate uh, students, uh, not so much for undergraduates, and indeed, you know, it, it is a much more subjective form of assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, continuous assessment picked up as a concept. Um, uh, we, we heard about this uh, earlier on, but, uh, you know, uh, yeah, continuous assessment is really easier said than done. So, um, but I really don't think exams is the most important problem, as I hope that it will resolve itself, as it were, in a post-COVID world. Um, and perhaps in blended forms, uh, we keep uh, the exams as face-to-face -face and move other parts of the uh, of the learning process online. Uh, but we need to acknowledge that we, yeah, uh, there's no tap in the back uh, on that for that, uh, for, for trying, but perhaps not for uh, achieving this. Uh, the most important is, uh, I think, um, the the loss of interactivity, and uh, by that I mean that um, this this loss of the of, of a communication stream, let's say, which is uh, body language, uh, looking at students and looking at you know understanding if they are following or not, um, minimizes the ability of a, a, a tutor to to customize um, um, a, a lecture on the fly, yeah? so uh, know where to slow down or speed up or you know, sport exceptional students that are really bored and, and have, you know, uh, uh, do this balancing act that we all do uh, in, in, in classrooms. Um, and uh, this is because simply, you know, in physical classrooms, there's a lot of nonverbal communication. This is humans are designed for that. And that's simply not the case in, in digital classrooms. Uh, yes, we, we used QA and uh, polls and everything um, uh, that Zoom provided and actually the technology uh, providers uh, you know, rose to the occasion, provide additional forms, and we use those, and that, that's that's nice. As I, I also mentioned it as a positive, but to be honest, these are too rudimentary, uh, let's say, to be tasked with the extent of interactivity a classroom needs. Um, yeah, we have to, to remember that Zoom and WebEx and all of that were not designed for education, eh? and yet we did rather well with them. Um, so um, I don't want to leave this as a negative point, uh, so I would just close by saying uh, that I think what is the the challenge uh, is uh, to to learn from these other courses that was me were mentioned in in, in the keynote speech, eh? the courses that were designed as uh, digital natives, eh? courses in programming, for example, in DataCamp and Coursera and so on, that are recently popping up, and they were designed as digital natives, and uh, that's also for some YouTube channels. Um, and in these newer formats, you see, you know, different visual prompts, different forms of interactivity, di different roles for the instructor. Eh? Uh, so most of the lectures are pre-recorded, interaction happens around problem solving and so on. And this is not easy, but I think there is, there is pre uh, precedence and we should learn from this. And you know, there are chairs to pick. And I would say um, we need to try and try hard to, to assimilate them. So that's all from my part. Yeah, Christos, thank you very much for your big overview about um, in very many topics and very many uh, uh, opportunities, but even challenges. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think we, we have to um, finish here at um, 
255. So it, it's better to, uh, to go further on and then we can make a small discussion in the end. So I now I look to Andreas Körner. Uh, uh, he comes from mathematics uh, from the University of Wien, Vienna. Uh, hey, and you are... University. Yeah. <laughs> hello. Yeah, hello. Um, so Andreas, do you like to uh, well, give us some answers? Continue. Thank you very much. Um, I will start, let's say, with the positive issues. Uh, in our institutions, we saw being that people, especially the staff and the administration, were busy with the technical issues the last, let's say, 15 months. The side effect was that uh, a certain review of the didactical methods of, let's say, uh, checking if the constructive alignment is, is made uh, in the lecture and in the, ex in the exam, um, so besides the technical issues, what we had, we had some benefits in improving, let's say, the, the tactical issues. This was very positive. And of course, uh, the skills were improved on the student side, in the administrative part, in the staff side. I would say our digital skills improved a lot the last 12 months, I would say. Um, I can agree in TU Vienna was uh, one issue where the students are now very in favor with keeping it alive are the recorded videos. Um, the staff was a bit critical and said, if, this, if the videos are recorded, they will not come any longer to the lectures. This was not correct. Even in distance learning, students came. Let's say one minor negative part there was the students were present, let's say, as a name in the list, but they did not switch on the webcams. And this mm. is one of the negative parts. Somehow we have the idea that when you are home and you are, let's say, watching the video or watching the, the, the lecture live, uh, somehow distractions are present. So I remember myself when I was a student and I was learning and studying home uh, I started to clean the apartment or cook dinner or lunch or something like this so let's say uh, the place where you are uh, in your free time and when you're studying as well there this is a bit problematic and we saw that especially the beginner had some problems in this self-organization another issue uh, regarding these recorded videos and recorded exercises and what else um, students were recording almost everything. Either it was uh, prepared by the, by the lecture itself, and if not, then you had some screen casting uh, online, what was okay. But when you have, let's say, 700 hours of, of uncutted material in video, and you are 10 hours before the exam, then you have a problem. <laughs> Of course, this is an organizational issue, and uh, especially for the students which never showed up in the university, they started in the COVID semester. Uh, for them, it was somehow hard to organize themselves without any support, without any personal support of the staff or of the other students which were normally present as well in the lectures and the exercises. Let's come back to the positive things. Um, besides um, improving our skills, um, it shows up that in the lectures, exercise, seminars, an extension of teaching methods is, uh, is observable. So let's say this, the staff somehow reconsidered how to teach. And it's not only <laughs> in former times the blackboard and the students in front and you're presenting what you're presenting somehow uh, it's presented something before the lecture takes place so pre and post learning uh, is somehow a topic what we address now and of course um, methods in terms of keeping the attention of the students we all know the the rule after 20 minutes you lost the students um, attention and with some polls, with some questions where the students have to answer, or at least the opportunity is present that they can answer, this is somehow catching them back a bit. This is positive compared to the lecture hall where after half an hour, students start to sleep on the, on the table or um, so let's say get involved with other things. Another positive aspect is uh, the academic supervision. So bachelor thesis and master thesis and things like this, this was somehow positive. It's easier to get connected with the students which are not longer studying active in lectures and 
and seminars, which are sitting home and let's say work for their own. It's easier to make a certain video call for 20 minutes and just discuss a small issue. Um, before this was a habit, the students had to negotiate for a certain appointment, they had to come to the university, so it, it, this took longer time, let's say. Okay, on the negative side, I have just the issue, you need proper IT hardware, you need a suitable IT uh, internet connection. Um, this is not always possible, of course, you know, some frozen webcams in, in Zoom calls are, let's say, standard. The self-organization, I already discussed, somehow I observed this in my case as well, the amount of video calls increased exponentially. So I have, let's say, at least eight meetings and two lectures per day. Uh, this is something what, what we should reconsider in the, in the period when we come partly back in the office. And I just can, can underline the problem with exams. Um, oral exams, I have to say was possible and we have some positive uh, feeling that the oral exams with a, with a video meeting is, is possible if the connection is proper and you have a certain possibility to write something down or making a sketch with a pencil or something like this. But in written exams, we faced a lot of troubles. Um, the question about how to how to observe the students and how to guarantee that the certificates what we issue now are the same like we issued in 2019. This is a problem what, what was present in our institution as well. Well, this was my list. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Andreas. Um, yes, and thank you to announce even the point of self-organization. It's very strong, strong for us, uh, but even for the students we see. So, and we in, in Hannover, we don't know how many we uh, students we lost already. Uh, so we, we will see it in the next uh, terms. Thank you. Um, now um, I can go to Mariana Karainen. Karainen. You come from La Penranta, you are Educational Technology Manager. Uh, Mariana, what you can say us to us uh, to the two questions. Okay, hi everyone from Finland. Um, uh, from my side, as we work on the university services and uh, we have a digital learning team of 10 people besides the IT services. So uh, our team is taking care of the teaching technology and the pedagogical issues in our university. So, so this is kind of a little bit different side as we have been he hearing with the speeches before. So, so what are the pros on these issues? is uh, that I find that uh, all the centralized systems that we chose beforehand, that we installed into our university, that we launched, so LMS, uh, the, the lecture capture system, uh, the electronic exam systems, and so on. Uh, also the, the kind of the software for academic writing, more, more, maybe known better as, as the, the, the kind of the detector of plagiarism. So all these have come into use and they actually are working well. So this has been something that I found very positive so that the work has been worthwhile. Uh, also, also kind of the pedagogical training that we provide for our professors, whichever want to attend, whichever are in the need of pedagogical uh, training. So, so this has also been really, really on the positive side. Uh, what I also find very positive is that our professors have had a very positive attitude towards digitalization. So, so, so kind of, of course, we have the advanced ones that are going fast forward, then we have the, the, the mass of professors that are kind of like coming to, along. And then we have the ones that are kind of coming on the aftermath here a little bit later, but still yet, I find it very positive. You know, the pandemic has, has kind of like made all our professors to take three steps up on the staircase. And still yet they're on a very positive mode on doing this. And if I think of uh, the future coming up this coming fall, uh, also 
as we are thinking of the what's going to happen after after this academic year and how we're going to kind of like take take the next academic year into our our surveillance so so kind of like uh, the idea of okay let's do this together again are we going in a hybrid mood are we doing blended are we on campus what are the reasons to go on campus i think the keynote speaker made made a very good um uh kind of a kind of a uh, sentence that in that way that he mentioned that there has to be a reason to go to campus i think there has to be a wow factor to go to campus so so that's something that we have to just with our kind of universities that what's going to be the vow factor to go to campus and what's the vow factor be, to be online so so this is these are some issues then if i look at the the student side from our perspective i think that now academic year is actually academic year due to the fact that uh, studies can be done uh non-dependent on time or place or either the or so meaning that you can choose courses around the year rather than having a fall semester and a spring semester like we used to have so this is something that i find very positive that if a student has an urge to graduate earlier to do their studies earlier forward so this this has come very relevant it's possible for them and uh then about the assessment uh I think that's also kind of like developed really well, meaning that uh, we have the continuous assessment, we have the electronic access exams, we have still yet the traditional exams that, that are needed so that the surveillance is done as properly as it has to be done on certain exams. But then again, you know, the, the, the mixture of assessing uh, tools is something that I find very positive now that we're using all of them in our university. Okay, then if we think of the challenges, I really, really find it that uh, do we give enough support for the professors from our side, if I think mm -hmm. of it? Uh, is there something lacking? What, what they would be needing more? Are, are we really you know, providing them all the help that we can? Also, of course, you probably pro as professors know that uh, the, the, that research is your number one, and then comes the teaching. So, so uh, my kind of like challenge is that, okay, do you as professors have enough time to develop your teaching? And then again, uh, like, like uh, are there skills to shift from traditional teaching to digital? teaching so so these are these are the ones that kind of like from my point of view and my team's point of view we discuss a lot and then uh of course we have to think of the programs so so are they actually we we came from one phase with the programs now we're on on a phase that the pandemic actually made us to do with the programs and now we have to kind of like start thinking how are we going to teach the programs in the future which programs are going to be online totally maybe which programs are going to be blended learning which can be taught hybrid what's the reason to teach hybrid and and kind of evaluate about adult students, about uh, younger students that are coming from high school directly, and so also about the campus experience. So, 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 so these are the things that I find kind of like challenging. How are we going to cope with, with the things? Uh, there also was a question in the keynote, or, or there was actually the question before the keynote about the, uh, about the labs. So, so this is something that's also very challenging. Do we have simulations? What kind of simulations can be done online and what, what can be done then? Where, where do you have to come to the campus? So, but I guess this is from my side, my point of view and our point of view from the university services. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mayana. And you gave us a very good view or perspective from the uh, university services, the technology a little bit. And thank you even for, for um, 
uh, uh, giving a view on the shift from traditional to uh, the distance learning. And I, I thought we never had such a intensive discourse about learning and teaching in the university. So the window is very much open uh, for this uh, kind of discussion. And uh, that is a very, very big, um, yeah, opportunity or it's a, it's, there's a, there's a very much potential for us to, um, yeah, to make learning at universities better and uh, stronger. Thank you very much. Um, now I look to the both of the students. Brenda, you, um, you're the first one. You came from Madrid. And um, I think uh, you and even Rosa Talala from La Penranta will give us a, um, a view from, the, from you as an undergraduate student. Yeah, you are the group we, we also have, perhaps we, we lose some of you, but uh, perhaps you can say us, uh, give us a perspective from your side. Yeah, sure. Uh, so first of all, uh, good afternoon and thanks a lot for the opportunity. I'm very happy to be here today. And for the first question, which is uh, opportunities and strengths and advantages, I definitely have to say in my experience that the most important one that I've noticed is uh, having much more time. So I live very far away from my university as many of my classmates and we have to take every single day uh, public transportation. With um, classes online, we don't have to do that anymore. And the time that we are saving, we can invest it in other things like study more on our own uh living more exercising or even uh participating and starting our own projects uh from our homes in in other countries like said before a uh, projects abroad um so definitely has to be that having more time i feel like in general my mood and my grades have improved a lot because of this but i do feel like there's also some other disadvantages but first of all i would also like to um stress other of the of the advantages that I feel I've had during this time, which is the recordings that have been mentioned. Um, I think that uh, it can be seen as a small gesture, but it actually is uh, has improved my methods of studying a lot. Maybe sometimes I feel the blanks going back to those uh, recordings and it has helped a lot in my studies in general. So for the disadvantages and the challenges that I've experienced during this period of time, I would definitely have to stress uh, two, which is the fir first one has to be the lack of, not the lack, but the difficulty in concentrating and focusing on the class. So some classes are 90 minutes long and it's a very long time to be in front of a computer, uh, just listening and just attending a class. And with the amount of distractions that most students have in their homes, like mobile phones, uh, sisters, young, young, young siblings, and it can be very distracting. So it, it's very difficult to attend uh, classes from home. Uh, but I would like to focus and one of my biggest fears during this period of time had definitely has to be uncertainty, uncertainty. Um, so since the beginning of the pandemic, we've had uh, three exam periods. I'm going again back to the exam periods, but we've had three. And in the last one, I would say that uh, the exam for maths and also the protocols against COVID-19 have definitely been very clear. However, for the first two ones, I don't think they've been that clear, but I mean, it's very, it's, it's understandable because it's a pandemic, it's something new, it's something different, but they were not as clear as I personally would, would like to, them to be. Um, so for example, in Spain, we had a wave at the, late January and a lot of the, the, the cases went up a lot and we didn't know whether the exams were going to be online, whether they weren't, were going to be um, on person, whether they weren't to be uh, in a test format, whether they weren't, were going to be uh, on an oral format, uh, how the exams were going to be carried out in general. And we didn't know that uh, until like a few days, two days before the exams, which definitely increased our stress as students, as persons, and just, just in general, like it made it very difficult uh, for us to study. So yeah, those would be what I found that my disadvantages, disadvantages and advantages have been during this period of time. 
Yes, thank you very much. And uh, yes, the January and February, uh, even in uh, our country, was very was horrible uh, for thinking about exams and the, if it's oral or not oral, on, uh, online or not online. So um, yeah, I think uh, even in Hanover, we uh, stressed the students very much because we were not very clear um, for a long time. So, and that's very important for making good exams. So thank you very much, Brenda, for giving us this um, perspective. Now I look to Rosa Talala, you come from uh, La Penaranta, Finland. Um, perhaps uh, you can give us some more uh, aspects you see yes. on pros and cons. Yes, so these are some positive aspects I experienced during distant learning. The period of distant learning has created flexibility for students to study according to their own schedule and from places farther away from the university. Courses at LUT are progressing from traditional lecture and exam based course structures to course structures that aim to keep the student engaged throughout the course using continuous evaluation methods which I find to be preferable for learning the information. And in addi addition, I, I enjoyed the flexibility in exam time and place. Um, most of my exams were in electronic exam room where the student can choose the time to take the exam or online Moodle exams that had a set time but could be taken from anywhere. Um, in fact, I took one of my exams before Christmas in a cabin in Northern Finland. And then some of the negative aspects of distance learning are that some necessary hands-on laboratory work is impossible to adapt to online environments. Um, interaction between teachers and other students was poor and as a result, I felt a lack of support in my studies. I experienced that successful group problem solving was difficult on Zoom, which is unfortunate since working through challenging problems as a group improves my understanding of the concepts needed to solve the problems. And lastly, I know from personal experience and from talking to my peers that this period of distant learning has been challenging to most students. The student life is more than just studying and the lack of social interaction between students has increased loneliness and decreased mental health for many students. Uh, simple things like eating lunch with friends, scrapping coffee after lectures or letting loose at student events counterbalance the workload and stress of studying. I believe that advancements made to online learning can diversify the university students experience but 100% distant learning does not provide students a motivating and in innovative environment for studying. So that's mine. Thank yes, you. thank you very much, Rosa. Yeah, in fact, uh, it's uh, even good that the pandemic will have an end and then we come, ca can come back to the university. Even the, you, you both of you uh, enjoyed the flexibility in time and flexibility in, in the place you are. And, um, but we, we need you even in the university to uh, work with you because uh, you say it in the, in the inter lack of interaction, even for the lecturers uh, is very, very hard. So thank you very much um, to all of you. Um, now I look um, to the Q and A's um, we, we have, and I look to Francesca and Marcos. Um, what do you think with, but what is a good question or a good um, comment we can start our discussion? So I can, I can start. Good afternoon from my side as well. Francesca Cristal is my name. It's a work uh, for Professor Gillen at the University, Leibniz University in Hanover. Um, I will start with a question which is uh, addressed to doc Dr. Varcic. And because Maria Rabelova um, did not understand your last point, and she asked, did you say that re remote examination is a weakness, a weakness of distant education process? Maybe could you please answer to this question? Well, <laughs> uh, that is the 
challenge, let's say, and weakness maybe that we have experienced in the last year that we should uh, be better in this or somehow support may maybe continuous evaluation, not a big exam in the end, because then we should be extremely careful with what we are doing and if it's a proper evaluation. So, so this is the challenge and the weakness, let's say of maybe current process and maybe necessary transformation with, that should be done in the process itself. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. Even yeah, the the um, point of how we make the exams, oral or in project, and even we like you say, not not in some summary form, but uh, continuous can can yeah make give away the weakness. Okay, Francesca, what is the next question we should go through? So I have, uh, I'm, I'm just having a look at the questions because there are also some questions who was not um, answered during the last, the first panel. Maybe we can, we can just go forward because I also saw that some of you already answered some questions, but maybe all of, all of you would like to also to, to add something. I would like to start with this one um, from, um, which will be one of the last questions. Do you think, uh, no, sorry, this is just related to the other one. So the university's IT departments organize in, instructional demos for teachers, students, minimizing technical difficulties that may arise in distance learning. Andreas Kerner, you already answered to this question. And uh, would you like maybe to add something or just to? Yeah, of course, of course. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is um, a topic at our university, which came up, let's say, in March 2020. We collected within the first days when it was clear that we will switch to distance learning. We collected all good practices examples so that uh, colleagues which were not involved in some electronic teaching before can somehow see particular examples how to um, switch to a certain distance format. So it started um, how to use Zoom, uh, how to use Moodle, how to use our infrastructure, which is uh, distributing the information to the students. So let's say the, the lecture information, the information about uh, exams, um, either it's a, a certain course where you have to hand over each week a certain uh, exercise or you have a final exam in the end or you have midterms or whatever. So this was what I said before, uh, the, the skills in digital issues improved a lot, especially in the staff side, I would say. But as well, things like how to digitalize uh, handwriting for the students when they have to do something <clears throat> in the exams. So solve particular examples in math, for example, how to digitalize. And we collected, let's say, the best five apps what were available on the market at this time and how to use it, where you should be careful when you have a certain freeware uh, and, and, and suggest the freeware, not additionally costs are, are uh, establishing for the students. So we, we tried to do this. And in the beginning, of course, it was working, but being that this amount of information were increasing over the time. Of course, there were a certain moment when students and staff started to stop reading this and uh, again started to ask, uh, how can I find this? Or just uh, waited that some people were explaining this to them. But it's always better to have this collection because as a lecturer, for example, in the, in the lecture, you cannot explain this. And to refer to a certain material or to a certain uh, collection of documents and some, some experience of students and lecturers, this, this helped a lot, I have to say. We are still collecting, uh, being that in the last semester, of course, you found out uh, this is working not so, so well. We changed this and this. And um, yeah, this repository is quite quite huge now. And to be honest, to read it from the beginning is quite a challenge <laughs> for both lecturers and students. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Andreas, for explaining Welcome. a little bit deeper. Now I look, uh, Markus, you want to say something? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, thank you very much for all your presentations. I do have a question, uh, especially directed to the to students. So um, my question would be, uh, and also you especially mentioned the issues of mental health and uh, the problems of loneliness and lack of interaction, which uh, causes severe damages, which is quite obvious for all of society due to the pandemic, but I think for students especially. So my question would be, uh, in that, while well, in that field is surely uh, in field is surely problematic, how about how would you evaluate the impact on your learning outcome? Do you think you learned less during the last year, or maybe even more? And maybe you could also try to quantify it a bit if you look at your fellow students, as far as you're in mm -hmm. touch with them. So Thank person you. personally, um, this year I took uh, more more credits than. Um, I was supposed to, so in a way, um, I took more courses, but um, there was some struggle with uh, motivation, which I find to be a common problem with most students, um, which may have uh, hindered the progress for some students. You have to be very self-disciplined to complete all your studies at home. So for me personally, I was able to complete um, the more courses. Maybe my grades were in some courses slightly lower, some courses maybe the same as usual. But um, uh, I know that some of my peer students who might, may have not been as organized or who might be very young, maybe 19, 20 years old, they don't have much organization skills or they get easily distracted. I know my brother, younger brother, who also is in university, he gets easily distracted. Um, those students might have struggled much more. Mm. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, Brenda, would you add something to that as yeah. well? Yeah, sure. Uh, so same as her, I actually took more credits this year than I was supposed to. And I feel like my grades, like I said before, have actually improved. So I think that this year I've definitely studied and learned more than in previous years. So yeah, but it depends on the person. And like she said, uh, also self-motivation and just being disciplined is very important because being many hours in front of the computer can be very difficult. Um, so it depends on the person, definitely. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. Perhaps we can look again to our um, challenges or risks. Um, and one of the risks you say, you, you, all of you or some of you said was the engagement of interaction, uh, like the students um, also um, said. Um, what is What do we have to look for the next steps when with the when we come back what what should we do to um, work with the lack of interaction the students um, had in the last terms do we have to reflect it do we have to make something special um, now in the next months for example in the next term when all of them come back or should we start again with a new normal semester to combine new types of lecture, but not to work with the lack of interaction they had in her life. What do you think? So that was a question to all of our uh, panelists. Mariana, what do you think? Okay, I think the interaction should be taken into consideration as, as, as you're planning the whole program the next academic year. And then within the courses, so, so there has to be interaction at, at from a point to another so that, so that the course is designed so that, that you make sure that you have interaction points. And, and then, then again, of course, we come to the tools and, and is, it, is it on campus or is it somewhere else? But, but basically, so the whole program, so the academic year to make sure that each year students have the interaction approximately the same amount. And then again, within a course, of course, we have some courses that are, are just kind of like 
read the book and take the exam type of courses. But then again, the other courses have to be more interactive. So, so kind of this way, I think there has to be the mixture and then just to the assurance on the whole academic year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, now I look if we have some more questions. I'm not sure in the Q and A. Um, there are, yeah, there is one open question, which is more or less related to actually to the last topic what we already talked. But I would like just to, to read it. Um, as this period offered the opportunity to faculty and students to resist their relationship with administrative support personnel in general. And in what ways? Well, some of you just as I'd like to answer. Actually, this is the relation as it is talking about the relationship within within the faculty and students, but also with the administrative and support personnel. Mariana, it could be maybe one of your topics as you're working in the service. Okay, I didn't quite catch up with the question. So, so can you once more please repeat and then I'll give you the answer. Yes, sure. As this period offered the opportunity to faculty and students to resist their relationship with administrative support personnel in general and in what ways? This is one of uh, the last questions and that you can find if you just have a look in the Q&A questions in the questions at 2.45 o'clock. Okay, let, let's see. Before Maria Jan just answered, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. this, this open question. Just not, it's not be answered. Yeah, perhaps I can say something about the University of Hannover. Um, we have a, yeah, a, a, a part of our administrative um, part of our university makes e-learning and support uh, since some years, many years. But I would say they, uh, for, for some months, they get the heart of the university because they had the solutions, they had the answers um, to thousands of questions, how to work with a with Zoom, how to work with Elias, Moodle, and so on. So um, I said, I saw that this um, team of our e-learning support was uh, was very, 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 um, yeah, in the middle of our university, and they made a very good job. Um, and now, and from the university, um, yeah, from the top of the university, we saw that we have to. Um, grow up this team because um, we ne will ever have uh, the questions um, first to the teaching, then to the assessments, and even to um, yeah to um, have some, to get some tools to work with. So I think the relationship um, between administrative support and the teachers get closer in our uh, university. Mayana, what do you think? Yeah, sorry, I, I, I found the question finally because of the time difference. So I was looking, Francesca, with the time you mentioned, but we oh, have a sorry. little... <laughs> it's okay, it's okay, don't worry. Um, um, uh, I think so too. Uh, from from uh, our perspective, I think that uh, our uh, team, so the digital learning team, we have become very close to our professors, our, our various schools. And then again with the IT department. So within the university services, we have become closer due to the fact that, that we're doing this together and, and plus the professors. And like I said, uh, just as the first, actually the first, first uh, positive issue is that we, we have been building, you know, for years, the centralized systems, we have been building our pedagogical kind of like like the little packages that we offer our professors and and we also have this kind of a kind of a uh, depository depository of little video clips that was actually earlier mentioned over here uh, so so that the teachers can also look 
for for certain things how how do i teach with zoom how do i do this how do i how do i transfer a moodle course foundation to another one and blah 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 so so yes and and we're actually having really good discussions and we're planning diff different ways of kind of starting next academic year already we're in august having for the professors we're having a, a different kind of a kind of a um, day workshop day and then we have also for the program leaders a different kind of a work day so so that we were discussing earlier about like how to take the whole academic in, year into consideration so these are the things that have kind of strengthened our relationship mm, thank you very much now we have another questions perhaps all of you can say something about from the perspective of the students, but also from the perspective of the lecturers. Um, should the universities demand the use of a single uh, digital learning platform, for example, WebEx, Zoom or Teams for all courses, or should they let the teachers decide? That is a, uh, it could be a question from the University of Hannover because we, uh, since uh, over the all, all of the time of the pandemic we had, a discourse about how many um, digital learning platforms we need and which are the best one and why do, don't we have Zoom it in Hannover. So perhaps uh, some of the others can say something. Radoslav, what do you, what do you think? Mm -hmm. I think we should have one platform, but also even at our faculty, we had three major platforms. So and it was a reason for students not to be satisfied as well with this distance learning. It was, it was let's say, de more demanding for, for them to switch from one platform and think about, oh, which platform now and all the management. So, but it's maybe it was better for the lecturers because everybody picked one optimum platform for his size group of students and maybe style of the teaching but i i think for the students is very bad so that's my opinion okay thanks you thank you andreas i can agree completely but what we found out was that the students adapt easily compared to the staff members so it's better the version that uh, uh, the lecturers uh, find a certain platform where they feel comfortable. And what we saw was that the students adapt to almost everything, at least something is offered. But basically, I agree completely with the colleague. <laughs> Thank you, Christos. What do you think from Athens? I, I completely agree with Andreas, so, um, and Radoslav indeed. Um, I, uh, keeping um, you know the same platform across uh, lectures and uh, so on is, is much better for the students. It also reduces this uncertainty that uh, one of the students uh, talked about before, so that's fine. Although it's not such a big deal because indeed our students adapt to amazing things. Uh, they know you know they work on many more platforms that we do. But uh, I think a, a, an interesting uh, side question is, and it, it's it's in my mind. Uh, I mean I don't have a, an answer to that. Is uh, of course, the platforms we are talking about, so WebEx and Zoom and so on, are not digital um, uh, education platforms at all. Uh, they were designed for, you know, remote collaboration, workshops and things like that. And we use them, perhaps a bit abuse them as well, um, as very flexible tools to do uh, a big part of the education cost, which is this teaching. Now, the question, uh, I think, um, uh, is, and I'm, I'm not sure that we've all answered it, is whether we should continue using these, one of these, or, you know, depend, but, or do the universities have to invest in, you know, digital, you know, pr proper digital infrastructure, or the blackboard and so on type, uh, or a mix, or what, what is the lesson from this? Um, uh, so I, I'll just put it uh, as a question because I, I don't have an answer to this. Um, there are pros and cons, I guess. Uh, but and I have to say that I, I really um, appreciated the flexibility of this, let's say, Zoom and so on, WebEx platforms, although uh, we bumped into all sorts of uh, things that they didn't manage, so workflows and mm -hmm. exams and, uh, you know, uh, and, and I think uh, going forward, universities that, um, uh, let's say, don't, haven't invested heavily on this, let's say, um, 
digital infrastructure for remote education, so the proper ones, uh, need to make up their minds on, on what is the best way to, to go. So I, I don't know the answer to that. But. Yeah, thank you very much, even for the question. It's uh, I don't have an answer as well. So uh, what perhaps some of our students have a, a view of of the first question, or perhaps even to your question. Yeah, I do have one. I'm sorry, I don't know how to put my hand up, so I'm sorry about that. But yeah, for the first question, I definitely feel like having one or at least the few the better apps is the best option here. I have downloaded like six different apps just for classes and it's a lot of storage just that it takes from my computer and it, it's difficult for some students to have like very up-to-date uh, technology to keep all of these apps in their computers. Plus it's apps keep changing every single time and sometimes it's very difficult to keep with all of the changes that they are making if there are too many so in my opinion one is the best option in my university we only use what well, we use for classes we only use one and i think that in comparison with other universities that i also attended classes to having one up one app for classes is just the best option instead of a lot of different and yeah that would be my opinion for the first question for the second one it's a little bit more complicated so <laughs> okay thank you perhaps now we have a, a last question uh, we have to finish but a last question from one of the um participants and um, the collaboration of the students has it changed because of the remote nature of the work what do you think um if you come now, as what do you think? It's a it's a change of collaboration for you as a student. Do you have a short answer? Um, I'm not sure. Yes, yes. Um, I feel like uh, the collaboration between students in the same course um, is a little bit dif difficult since uh, when you're in person together, you obviously talk about the things that happen in that course, or you solve the homework problems that are difficult together. But um, in addition, if you talk about collaboration as stud of students, uh, for example, across Europe or the possibility of connecting with students from farther away, that that's obviously um, much better collaboration now with all the technology and advancements to uh, video calls and things like that. But um, I, I think that the collaboration inside the courses is better in person in my experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So um, it's, a, it's even a positive view of the collaboration in the remote modus. Um, very good, thank you very much. Okay, now uh, thank you very much for uh, to all of you uh, for the discussion and your opinions and comments. Now we have a break till uh, 3.25 and then we can come together for the summary and the conclusion. And I think we, we uh, should make this break, take a coffee. And so we see us in 10 minutes. Have a nice time. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome. Uh, according to the schedule, we should start our panel, panel number two. So I would like to welcome uh, everybody who's uh, watching us and also our panelists. I see that we have more than 80 participants, which looks very nice. So we have uh, now some 15 minutes where at the, the beginning our panelists, and I will introduce them in a moment, will share some opinions and thoughts on distance learning because we have two, let's say, predefined questions that I would like to ask them and they will have some time to answer to this question. And after that, uh, we will have time for the questions from the audience. So I, I encourage your participants who would like to ask some questions or we may also select the questions already in our question and answer 
uh, chat or list uh, to send us some questions so we can discuss up to those uh, 50 uh, minutes, which is our slot. Uh, so that was uh, some organization. And now I would like to introduce our panelists. So uh, I will start with Anna, Anna Rosengren, uh, who's associate professor and chair person in pedagogical development group from Yenchaping uh, University. So welcome, Anna. Uh, we have also Katrina Mielonen, uh, who's a lecturer at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Lapern Rantel Lachti University of Technology. Welcome, Katrina. And we have also expert from uh, Leibniz University in Hanover, Cornelis Carter, who's uh, the head of e-learning services. So e-learning services, so he has experience with uh, distance learning and uh, e-learning in general. And I would like also to welcome our students. So we have three students, Corina Modis and Milena Shipovac, both undergraduate students uh, from Technische University uh, Vien. And uh, the third student is Elias Vassos, undergraduate student from National Technical University of Athens. So uh, also welcome to you. And uh, so that was uh, some introduction and now we should uh, go uh, in uh, the two rounds and uh, I have two questions prepared for you. So all of you have uh, some three minutes to answering or providing some uh, opinion on, on these questions. So the first question is, what are key opportunities or trends or advantages that you were able to identify during the distance learning period? So from your point of view, from your experiment, and uh, if I can ask uh, Professor Anna Rosengren for his opinion as the first speaker, please. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yes, this was a, a, a very nice um, question to, to think about uh, uh, clearly, and uh, especially with a background um, uh, from our own university, Yanshipi University, where we have um, studied uh, digital education from the perspective of um, the pedagogical perspectives that need to be integrated into uh, online uh, education. Um, and the means that we did that work was through collaboration and, and, um, and collegial learning. And I believe that uh, one of the opportunities that we have all seen during the last year um, was collaboration, the, a great deal of collaboration taking place in, in very many um, instances. We have seen collaboration among teachers, with students, uh, within in, uh, across the institutions and across universities. And I think that has been a, a great development. And I think that is something that we can really uh, take into consideration for the future. Um, and secondly, innovation, I believe, is, is a very important factor. So we have seen universities that have spoken about how their five-year digitalization plans became realized in five weeks, more or less. And, and I think that that's just uh, one example of the, the, the great uh, leaps of innovation that have taken place uh, during the last one and a half years or so. And, um, and so I believe that joining these two, collaboration and innovation, is really uh, what is at the heart um, for the universities at the, at the time. Uh, we have this tremendous opportunity to, uh, uh, to make continuous innovation um, into the DNA uh, of our ways of working. And I believe that the way to get there is through collaboration with students, with research, um, with our external partners and through collegial learning. Okay, thank you, Anna. So if I can conclude it, it means that uh, this period forced you and your colleagues to do more, more collaboration and speed up the innovation that otherwise would be slower or not so intensive. Yes, you, you, you could say that. Um, I, I, I saw this little picture of the coronavirus being the new CIO with the digital transformation expertise. And, uh, and um, uh, this was a huge force um, and we couldn't stop it. So we had to, we had to do whatever we could. And I think that 
um, this very important um, parameter of collaboration was how we made it happen. I think it's very, very strong. And I think that we may also remind ourselves that collaboration is one of the learning, um, one of the ways of learning that we often encourage uh, our students to take in courses. So, I mean, it is a, an established way of learning. Um, so so we, we kind of applied what we proposed to our students uh, to ourselves. And I think that is the way forward. Okay, thank you very much for, for sharing your experience with this period. And uh, let's move to another panelist and uh, Katrina, maybe. Can you uh, take your turn? Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, I taught with a few of our teachers and I collected a short list uh, what their opinions was and also my own, my own opinion. Uh, first, uh, what teachers thought that is good is that the new digital tools came out quite, quite fast. And we noticed that even, or if teachers felt that they might at first be difficult to use, uh, we're still working with the students who are native to use these these tools and these tools are familiar with them. Uh, then, then the second point that was strongly or was a really good opinion is that uh, students could study with their own schedules. They can uh, get uh, additional support uh, from the teachers. Teachers might make some team teams calls to them that is not often made, made, made in a traditional classroom teaching. Then what the teachers was happy that finally we are out of paper so all the documents are are in uh, in digital form, and there were, therefore it's easy to organize, organize and easy to monitor teachers, or teacher can monitor how students progress during their studies. Uh, uh, then, time and place, independent exams. Exams can be done electronically in electronic exam rooms or in Moodle, or sometimes exam can be a discussion between students and teacher. So that was my short list. Okay, thank you very much, Katrina. We will discuss, uh, I believe, some specific points from your experience uh, during the following discussion. But what was interesting uh, to me is that you talk about uh, electronic or digitalized exams because, you know, and, and probably it's similar in other universities. We have some exam period and doing those exams and all the paperwork is uh, uh, <laughs> really something that I don't want to repeat every year, but I have to. So yeah, yeah, that's nice if it is possible to do it and uh, convert it to digitalized exams that may be easier to process and handle for both sides. So that's very nice. Yes, and uh, this uh, continuous evaluation is now more than, than before when we teach uh, in, in traditional way. So it's better to continuously evaluate students than to let it to the final yeah, exam. Yeah, it's, it's easier yeah. to follow, follow them how they progress. Okay. Because tools helps teachers to do that. That's nice. Thank you very much. Thank and, you. Uh, okay. And the next one, uh, I guess it's Cornelis. Please, can you tell us something from the perspective of the head of e-learning services? Yes, my point of view is an infrastructure point of view. I'm not so much a teacher or in teaching. My job is to let all the systems uh, run smoothly. 
which is quite uh, next, uh, it's not easy. Um, for me, it's cooperation too, a very important opportunity to um, strengthen our, our systems to have way more tools for this area. We've got a big project aligned. Uh, it will start in August to uh, incorporate some cooperation tools directly into our learning management systems, which would be very nice. Um, so we uh, reacted very, in a very short period of time to get this stuff out of our house. Um, I think it's interesting to keep this online to, uh, format and tools for the cooperation, communication, and uh, cooperation um, aspects uh, online. So the students will be more, more flexible, uh, especially for student groups where they are working together. Um, what also is interesting is the um, opportunity to build innovations directly into our software because we are very open source driven. Um, University, we built our software since 20 years for, years for ourselves. Finally, we got an understanding that's important to build your tools for yourself and to integrate the tools for yourself in one or two main platforms, which make it easy to support as well as presence teaching, hybrid teaching, and online teaching. And we are prepared for all of that. So I like to build more interesting tools like a messenger, which is specially made for the purpose of universities, not WhatsApp, but a tool which can be used for teaching as well. It's integrated and connected to stuff in our learning management system. That's uh, some opportunities I'm looking forward to, to build that self. The main uh, problem is uh, we don't have enough experts and people to build all this stuff in just one year, but we have the resources. It's very crazy times and I'm looking forward to the next uh, 12 to 18 months to get some stuff uh, in the hands of our students. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, what I understood is that you spent most of the time improving uh, software, yes. software, improving technology. So yeah. we can maybe see some open source platform that integrates all of these things you mentioned in the future? Um, the platforms already exist. It's uh, mainly Stutopi, a German one, and Ilias. But I like to talk about to share the, the platforms or the connections between them and this uh, network we are building just now. I think it could be very interesting not to build one platform for everything, but uh, use best aspects of our platforms and put them together mm -hmm. with smart uh, interfaces. And uh, um, I always wanted to um, put the users to another platform, not the content, because that's the best way to consume it in the way it was designed. So I think there's a lot to do in uh, regard to uh, interface and to um, the interchange our views and our um, strength, building platforms, hosting platforms, and so on. OK. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I was told that uh, either Milena or Corina will answer to this first question. So it's up to you who want to start with this question, and the other will have opportunity to answer the question number two. So please go ahead. Um, yeah, I think I will um, answer this question. <laughs> okay, I just remind that our question is what are key opportunities that you observed or you experienced in this distance learning period? Um, for me as a student, um, I think a big advantage was that lectures were recorded because um, I think that pro provides a lot of flexibility. Um, for example, um, when um, for the, I, I think that it is very useful um, for exam preparation to that I can rewatch lectures. And also if I don't understand an explanation, a specific explanation at first, I can watch it um, twice or um, even a third time. So I think that was very useful for me for exam preparation. Um, also for me um, as a working student, as I'm always, um, I'm um, also working at the Technical University of Vienna. Um, I think that this flexibility that um, recordings provide is very nice because I don't, if I have um, much work to do, or if I have to prepare for another exam, and I think I have to use the time now for um, this specific exam, um, I know 
I know that I don't miss out any important um, explanations because I know that I can rewatch the lecture. And yeah, I think this is um, really a big advantage for me as a student. And also, um, I um, think that it, it was very nice that I could uh, manage my own time. So if I thought that I wasn't concentrated enough to follow, I know I could pause the lecture and come back if I, um, I don't know, drank some coffee. <laughs> and um, yeah, I knew I can, could rewatch it um, and manage my own time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I think that uh, your experience or your opinion uh, correlates with some other or opinions with, with other students that I was able to talk with. I'm a little bit surprised that uh, what as a student uh, you see as the most uh, benefit is that you can uh, replay the lectures because <laughs> I thought that you would like to see some fancy I don't know, explanations and, and, and something uh, very advantage in terms of uh, delivery, the information, the knowledge, some gamifications or something like this. <laughs> so, uh, but I must say that that's good for teachers because we don't need to spend a lot of time doing all these things. And uh, we just need to do some good lecture that you can replay and, and watch it again. Uh, I definitely agree with the opinion that uh, distance learning uh, provides opportunity for the flexibility and I see it uh, on the same way. So the flexibility is something that uh, I also appreciate as a teacher. So that's nice that we both share this. Okay, uh, in order to continue, uh, I would like also to ask the same question uh, to Elias. So Elias, can you also tell us what do you think about this? Uh, yes, uh, I completely agree with the state of uh, uh, lectures that are recorded and rewatchable. And I would also like to add that another uh, very important point is uh, the elimination of commuting, or um, so you could gain more sleep or more time to prepare for a lecture or a lesson, which is important. Also, um, it eliminates the anxiety of finding a good seat in an auditorium, you know, close to the board, uh, in a quiet spot. In an online lecture, you can, every play, every seat is the same. Uh, there are no distractions from other students, no noise. You can see very clearly the board. You can hear the professor very clearly. And it's also uh, very important that uh, it allows uh, people from uh, other cities or in the broader sense of any country or any place in the world to attend um, a lecture without having to live alone uh, by rent, for example, or without having to work uh, in the same time as they study in order to support themselves financially. And uh, another uh, aspect of a lecture which could be improved would be uh, some computer simulations of uh, phenomena that uh, have been studied in, for example, uh, fluid mechanics or heat transfer phenomena. And it's easier to see something uh, and uh, visualize it better so you can understand it better. And it helps a lot uh, the professor to explain something because you can only explain it using words up to a point. From there on, you need an image, or in our case, a computer simulation. And also, I'd like to point out that uh, in case uh, you would like to take a class from another semester, and it happens to coincide with one of your own in the timetable, uh, through distance learning and recorded uh, lectures, at least one of the two, you can be practically at the same uh, two places at the same time which is uh, very important in other, without um, electronic lectures, you couldn't attend both. You had to compromise, join half the time in one, half the time, yeah. So I think that's also a very good point. 
Okay, thank you. So I understand that uh, because of distance learning, you are able to do more things than, than before. Basically, it gives you more opportunities, yes. More choice. Okay. So thank you for the first round. Uh, I guess that we immediately, or I suggest to go immediately to the second round. So all of you can have possibility to also discuss what are the challenges or risk or threats that you saw during this distance learning period. So uh, in the first questions, you uh, talked about positive aspects and now let's move to negative aspects or it must not be actually negative, but what do you think that there are possible risk that if we stay longer in this distance learning period that we may have some, some issues in the future. So, uh, not to do any mess in uh, our round, I would again start with Anna. So Anna, please. Yes, yes. Well, um, I think that the challenges um, are can actually be seen as quite related to to the opportunities. So if if we if we were to assume that that bringing it, continuous innovation into the, the the DNA of universities is something that we have the possibility to 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 do to a greater extent uh, than before, uh, and if we could do that through collaboration, then of course there will that will demand a certain type of of a decision on uh, the way you want to go because you can't you can't go in all directions at the same time. So that is going to be a, a challenge. Um, and secondly, I also think about uh, the social dimension for, for students and, and other lifelong participants um, and, and staff, uh, the social uh, dimension. Um, it has been quite clear what the, that there is a social dimension in, in the physical university, in, in the campus uh, education. And that has been less obvious uh, in the digital setting. And I believe that we have to, to make sure that we have a, a digital community of belonging um, in, in, this, in this new format as well. Um, and also uh, social aspects, they come into play for, for, for faculty, for staff, um, so that we, we don't, because there have been, we have been under stress, of course, uh, there has been a, a lot of change. So that is also something that we need to take into to, to consideration to, to make sure that we don't put too much stress on uh, neither uh, students nor nor staff. Okay, thank you for, for your point. Uh, regarding the social dimension, uh, I saw that you are also from the School of Engineering, so maybe, <laughs> and uh, to explain this, I'm from the School of uh, Computer Science. So uh, in our case, uh, not being present and not to meet each other is at least it seems to be not so crucial for our students and it can be seen that it's advantage for them that they don't need to meet each other but uh, it was part of the joke that social dimension is, is the advantage not that the risk because in general that's definitely the risk okay uh, yeah I mean but but, but social um, social um... The social aspect can be handled in the digital format. We just need to, to make sure that 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 we that we do that. So it's it's not that it's dependent on the physical format, but we just have to make sure that we take it into consideration and that we handle it in in a good way. Yes, definitely. That's that's very important. Uh, thank you. And uh, may I ask Katrina for her opinion? Okay. Uh, as uh, as Anna just said i would also say that that these challenges they are related to opportunities uh, first uh, i told you that interaction with the teacher and student is is good but but if there are only these mass meetings arranged online uh, this interaction might be really poor and teachers, they don't know if there are students listening or not. It is, uh, it is difficult for teachers to know that. Uh, then online teaching, if there are some assignments, there might be shy students who don't like to present their 
assignments online to everyone else and uh, uh, teachers needs to or teachers might might don't know what to do in these kind of cases because they have different pedagogical skills and they don't necessarily understand these kind of situations. Then uh, these uh, digital tools or softwares, uh, they might cause some problems. There might be some updates in them during the teaching or or something don't work, they cannot, cannot make re records or something like that. Uh, then uh, this uh, student's information security or recognition, it might also cause some problems and, uh, and in exams, some additional work is, uh, is required to prevent and and also to monitor possible tries to cheat in these exams and uh, finally there is a lack of lab works so because of lockdowns the campus was closed and students couldn't go there so they had no chance to do lab works so that is also some kind of risk in the future if if they they cannot participate in lab works okay thank you so it seems that uh, katrina very nicely identify what is missing in distance learning and uh, if we combine it with uh, the positive aspects we maybe find a hybrid way how to efficiently deliver uh, the knowledge and, and and to provide the education so thank you again and uh, now again our expert Cornelis, yeah. please what do you yeah. see as a problem when implementing yeah. learning the challenges Sorry, yeah. um, the challenge and risks for me it's that structure uh, or there's not a quite good understanding that we have to change as an organization uh, organization as a whole. Um, it always it still feels like the online services, especially teaching services we do, uh, and something which is nice to have an appendix, something which will go away, but. It isn't the way I'm at my, I think, 16th year at this university doing more or less the same stuff, fighting for resources, explaining why this is important and so on, as much as important as uh, computer centers and libraries. So um, we have to always fight to get this understanding. We have to find our fundings sometimes for ourselves. We have got a lot of projects where there should be um, basic uh, structures which are not funded by projects and the teachers want more. I would love to give everyone an instructional designer with some time to improve the teaching to um, um, to be there when they are doing the transfer, but we can only support a small fraction of the teachers and mostly which are able to find funding for themselves via projects and other stuff, which is very sad. I would like to be there for everyone, and that is quite possible right now. And there's no, not a small hope, but not one that that will change in the next two or three years as a whole. I hope the organization will understand we have to be integrated and funded, like as a, yeah, like buildings and every stuff which is there since a lot of years. <laughs> That's very important to be just accepted as a main fundament for good teaching at the universities. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, do you think that this situation, I mean, the last year, uh, uh, make your position better or, or, or how, how do you evaluate it to this period? <laughs> I'm a bit skeptic, but maybe it's the point of view from our state, Germany, which did some cost cutting still cost cutting and there are some funding which are only 
for the next year um, secured, we aren't sure what will happen into uh, 2023 right now. So it's not, not, not sustainable right now. We are hoping, but it's the progress. Okay, thank you. We will see. <laughs> yeah. And uh, now the students' perspectives. So, what did you uh, dislike, or what do you what do you think it's the problem for distance learning? Or what's your opinion? Probably Milena. Yeah, it's it's on her turn. Thank you. Um, I would like to address a few points. Um, I think the first point is something that all of us experienced, students and teachers as well, and this is the so-called Zoom fatigue. It's when you spend a few hours sitting in front of your computer and you're just so tired and it's very hard to concentrate sometimes. So I think this is something that should be taken into account when organizing lectures and maybe not um, not scheduling a two hour lecture without breaks and things like that, that is not usually taken into account that happens to everyone. Um, a second thing is something that I personally um, had a few issues with and some of my colleagues, and this is this overload of tools uh, from different um, teachers. Some of them are using Zoom and someone is using the big blue button and then there's Teams and then there's the chat function. And sometimes you just get overwhelmed from different softwares and don't really know. Um, I think there should be some, some, some point where we, um, or at least in a certain university that there is not too much software where everyone can choose what they want. And I think um, there, there is also this topic of flexibility and uh, flexibility is good. And we're all learning how to be more flexible since the last year. And, but sometimes I feel as a student that there is too much flexibility expected from us. And we also expect way too much flexibility from our teachers. And sometimes it just gets um, a little bit difficult because deadlines are getting um, changed a lot of times. And yeah, that's also one, one of the issues. And there is this dependency on, on teachers' relationship with email and a certain communication channel. There are a lot of professors and lecturers that answer right away or in some normal time and we're very grateful for that but there's also a lot of people that just ignore our emails <laughs> and this could be solved earlier with um, okay those are the office hours and I'm just gonna knock uh, to the office door of my professor and ask a question if I don't get an answer to my email but this is not an option anymore so this is also something that um, that could be difficult. And um, the last point that I also would like to, to address briefly is um, um, I started a um, master last semester and uh, I didn't meet a lot of people and there were some moments where I felt quite isolated because you see the names of people and you, um, you know who they are, but you never actually met them. So I think it's it could be an issue, and I think it is an issue for, for students that are at the beginning of their studies and for the first time at the university that uh, the social component needs to be addressed um, from the students and from the teaching staff as well. And um, yeah, so that was from me. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you for, for your opinion, for your valuable uh, thoughts. So what I understand is that the problem is mainly in the organization. So not in delivery of knowledge, but how to organize it, how to simplify it, how to make it more, let's say, in a way that it can be survived with good mental health. And also the isolation. Yeah, definitely that's, that's the problem. So I guess that's the problem that maybe all of us would mention. Okay. And uh, Elias, Elias uh, uh, made the statement that uh, it is advantage to have several sessions <laughs> or to jump from one session to another session. So what was uh, your thinking about the disadvantages, Elias, please? 
Yes, um, while there is, it is advantageous to have the option, I agree with Milena uh, of, on, on the topic of uh, Zoom fatigue. It's impossible to watch more than two or three lectures a day uh, with uh, co keeping uh, concentrated. And uh, I noticed the tendency for the lecture to become more stale, more monotonous, very little input from students. I don't know if it was a lack of participation because they were doing something else or because they just didn't want to. But uh, that makes um, the lectures more tiring for uh, somebody to watch a lot of them consecutively. Also, when you're sitting on a PC it, alone on your, in your room, it's easier to distract yourself with something else. You're on your desk, or another tab on the computer, uh, somebody texted you, it's easier to skip from the lecture to that. And uh, additionally, when uh, there is a little input from you in the lecture and uh, you can distract yourself, there is a gap that forms between uh, the lecture and you. You know, it, it, it widens the more time progresses. And it also as a student of chemical engineering, my lab exercises, which are very important for me at least, uh, they have become simulations and projections or stories. For example, somebody uh, describes it. And I think it's depriving valuable experience, valuable hands-on experience on how to conduct yourself in a lab and how to make measurements, what's the earth there, what's, uh, how this is called, you know, and you may end up in a laboratory in the future and not know, for example, the names of a few glassware. And um, also, what I noticed was that um, due to the lack of student input, very few questions, very few comments, um, the pace of learning was faster because uh, no one was there to stop the professor to ask a question and they kept going, which is natural, but uh, for me, this made uh, the lectures much harder to concentrate because if you missed, for example, three minutes, you missed something important. Maybe you couldn't uh, follow 100% uh, for the rest of the time. And it's, it's a point that I'd like to make. Uh, also, another but very local problem was that it depends on electricity and if there's a power outage, for example, locally, few students might not be able to attend the lecture. But that's minimal. It's not very important. No. Okay, thank you. So I saw that uh, you are from School of Chemical Engineering, yeah? So some practical laboratories are very important for our study. Is it true? Yes, it's- Have you been uh, able to attend some during this period or have you been able to do some experiments by your own? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it's very difficult to do experience yeah. at home because some of the reagents are maybe even illegal to acquire at home. I don't know, I haven't uh, searched that much, but uh, no. Uh, some labs uh, were not uh, able to be redone uh, from uh, physical uh, experience. So some of them stayed at the screen and not in my hands. Yeah, yeah, okay, I understand. Okay, so thank you all for answering these two questions. And uh, I now show, because there was some pool uh, during your presentations and I, would like to show the results and we may discuss about these results and then do some uh, uh, question and answer section. So probably you see it. I apologize that it's uh, in this way. So the poll number four was uh, the challenges for teachers. And as you can see, uh, the answers uh, or there are two or three answers that are almost because the question was uh, to select three top most uh, issues that you can uh, see in in this so the most uh, mentioned one was uh, keeping students interested in the course content and its 
aligned with also your opinions so that uh, uh, keeping uh, the students uh, uh, paying the attention is very important, but uh, using the distance learning is very problematic. And the number two is hands-on experience. And uh, definitely if we don't have any labs and uh, other way how to do some practical experience, uh, then it's very, very problematic. Uh, maybe do you have some comments? Do you see something uh, interesting in, in these answers? It seems not. So we can look at the other one and that was challenges for students. And as a biggest challenge, and you can see that it uh, won uh, uh, with almost 89% uh, was uh, that uh, for students, it's very difficult to stay focused and motivated uh, to attend the class or to listen the entire class. And again, it's what we uh, heard during uh, your presentation. So it seems that uh, this is something uh, which is a problem in general, not only the, yours as a, uh, selected uh, students from the uh, group of students. And some other uh, at the same percentage. Uh, so setting uh, a schedule to make the same hands on time and so on, uh, let's say less problematic, like uh, in comparison to this uh, motivation and, and, and keeping focused on on the classes and and, and uh, be awake during all these classes. So that was our poll. And uh, now because we should end uh, in five, maybe 10 minutes because we started a little bit late, uh, we can uh, select some questions that we received from our audience. So when I find my Zoom window, I will, okay. I need to find a yeah, question and answers. So what was, uh, or if I try to ask a little bit more general, because we said that there are some advantages and there are some disadvantages of distance learning. So uh, maybe kind of provocative question. Uh, can you imagine that uh, you will sometime in future uh, deliver your entire study program just online, just in distance form without even seeing your students? Or do you think that it's not possible because what we saw also in the presentation uh, in the keynote speak or by keynote speaker, we saw that uh, especially in the United States where of course the education is paid, uh, there are some, uh, uh, let's say opinions that uh, doing it completely distance may be better because you can reduce the price and the result will be almost the same, but for the students it will be better because they don't have to pay uh, too much money. So do you think that it's even possible to do it in this way? Can I answer? Yeah, yeah, of course, please. Okay, so in our Unity, University, La Peradalat, University of Technology, we actually have a master's program fully online. We started 2015, our first fully online program. And now in our school, if I now remember correct number, we have seven different uh, programs uh, from uh, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and energy technology fields that are our, our student can take them so that, uh, that they take only some laboratory courses so that they visit at campus like one or two week 
but the uh, rest of the courses can be totally be online. So mm -hmm. what we have. So you don't have any problem delivering these courses because you have some experience that it's possible it, it can work. Uh, maybe I have a follow-up question. Uh, do you think that, uh, let's say, the students or maybe labor market or possible employers of the students consider this degree in the same way as a, let's say, traditional earned degree? I guess that anyone can answer. What do, what do you think? If you just take just the online degree, so you never met the university, you never met your teacher, you just get the certificate that you complete your university in online mode. Do you think that, uh, or are you okay with this if I ask the students, or do you think that someone who, let's say, attend some university of big name has better position when asked or, or when going to the interview for the job? Maybe uh, I can uh, try and uh, make a comment here. Um, yes, uh, also at JU, we have uh, quite some experience with um, online uh, programs. And this is not unique for, for JU in, in, in any respect. Uh, there are several uh, universities that, have, uh, that are offering online programs. Um, but but of course what what is need, what is needed is uh, to to make sure that the pedagogy <laughs> uh, allows for continuing um, uh, following um, the education with engagement <laughs> that is kind of the, the the key issue I believe in 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 uh, uh, in a sense and uh, would those kind of um, would those kinds of uh, programs be seen as, as inferior to other programs? I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think there is a huge potential um, in the digital um, in the digital setting. I'm, I'm not trying to, to, to say that there are no problems with the digital um, setting. There are, of course, um, but, but there's also a, a, a fantastic uh, dimension um, that, uh, that, that has um, many benefits. There's a democratic dimension. Um, there is a, a diversity dimension. Um, you can also make the world quite small. You can have guest speakers from, from, from the other side of the world. You can have authentic examples Examples. Uh, this was listed here, but you can uh, have examples uh, from from uh, from uh, partner universe from partners, external partners, uh, for instance, uh, in your course. So um, th there is also a huge potential. So it's it's. I, I think that we should not just uh, look upon um, digital as something uh, that does not really um, manage to be the same as the physical i think we should um, we should think in 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 other ways we should think in terms of um w w what can the benefits be and they can be quite substantial i believe we haven't tapped into all of them at all yet but i think that we will uh, see that there are quite some 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 benefits to be to be um to be found in the digital setting Okay, okay, great. Uh, maybe one last question. What about students? Would you like to study entirely as a distance learning um, in a distance learning mode or it's better for you to attend the university if you can? Or what would be the difference for you in this? Can I answer? Yeah, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the best solution would be uh, some type of hybrid education because that allows us flexibility. But I think especially for students that need more practical experience, need to work at labs, um, of course, it's not going to be the same if you have um, um, a degree from an online university and have never been in a lab compared to someone who actually did uh, do some work 
So I think there are uh, studies that are good for this, to, to, for this type of hybrid or even um, distance learning um, thing, but I don't think it's good for every, um, mm -hmm. for every type of studies. Okay, thank you. Uh, I apologize, uh, we have to finish our panel because according to the schedule, there's uh, some follow-up uh, uh, program. So I would like to thank you all, uh, all our panelists and also all attendees of this panel because we had more than 80 participants, so that's great. So I believe that it was uh, interesting for you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, answering to our questions. And uh, now there should be some short break. After that, there is some summary session. So we'll see you there. Thank you. I would like to welcome all the um, attendees as well and uh, the panelists. We have here today uh, six panelists from different universities of um, this alliance. And my name is Gary Rakotze, as I have said before. Basically, I'm head of the Digital Teaching and Learning Service Unit at my university. It's from Austria, TU Wien, so the Technical University in Vienna. And the department where I'm belonging is the Strategic Education Development Center. And basically, um, as we also have heard in the introduction, it is a really yeah, intense and interesting times that we have uh, behind us one year of this pandemic that we had to shift from um, from a, um, basically presence university in many cases to a fully fully uh, virtual environment and that within weeks and this was challenging and today we have here six panelists uh, three of the student view um, two from the academic staff and one IT expert or from the administrative uh, part and just uh, to inform you, we have a, a question and answer panel here as well. So please use it, please raise questions. And it is also possible to uh, upvote uh, questions if you like, for example, was what other have asked, please do so. And we will have time, plenty of time at the end of the session to answer them. And if you have uh, direct questions to the panelists, feel free to um, write the name, for example, in brackets into the question, and then we can address them directly. So, but this is enough uh, about me and the introduction. We are interested in the um, panelists and uh, I don't see Oana. Uh, she has not activated her cam yet. So I would uh, jump to the second panelist, uh, Zybek uh, Krivka, he is um, assistant professor at the Faculty of Information Technology, the Department of Information Systems, and he's from the Czech Republic from Brno University of Technology. So Zbigniew, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, am I uh, supposed to uh, start with the opportunities and then there will be second round with the, with the challenges or should I do both uh, three Do both. minutes of the plus and three minutes of the, the okay okay plus. yeah so uh as most of us uh, i uh, i experienced three semesters of um, of online teaching and uh, i made few highlights uh, uh, and i will start with uh, with the opportunities or with the let's say positive highlights uh, i experienced during my teaching in fact i was teaching two erasmus courses and uh, three courses for czech students uh, during that time and uh, the first thing i i would say is that uh, uh, there uh, i enjoyed that there could be a wider uh, audience a wider audience uh, so uh, not only an old students could uh, could listen to, to my lectures but uh, in fact i had also a few few students that are not only uh, enrolled in the course but they were not from the university so 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 i like that very much uh, 
and thus um, what's a similar um, experience was for example from habilitation lectures or phd defenses where also the the guests from 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 abroad uh, were able to 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 listen the the, the defenses as well, also to to react to uh, to the defenses not only when they are from from official committee so that that was nice because of course the the traveling uh, uh, was not necessary in that case so that's uh, obvious uh, opportunity from the from the online teaching or from the online uh, communication in in general uh, from me for me personally for example because uh, a lot of lectures uh, are video recorded on our faculty and now almost everywhere so uh, if uh, it was possible for me to to have access to lectures also from 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 courses uh, that are not my field of study but or my my field of research but uh, i was interested somehow in them and i could uh, hear the lectures or talks even if i had no time during the lecture so i could i could see them later on so that was like the student view uh, of this online teaching or uh, of this online experience uh, then uh, from when when we leave the the exp experience with the with the lectures uh, uh, i liked that uh, also the consultation one to one consultation with students uh, when they could can be done online or they, they started to be like the standard to do them online uh, so uh, I like the time time flexibility, and uh, so it was possible to to have a, have a short chat uh, during the evenings when when, I, when both of us had time. So so that was nice. And uh, the the last thing, for example, uh, this semester uh, I I copus uh, copus uh, I I was a copus supervisor co, co supervisor sorry copus supervisor to a diploma thesis with uh, some some guy from a company and it was very nice that thanks to the uh, online briefings uh, it was quite easy to uh, be all three of us student me and the company guy at once and, and we can uh, discuss the semi results of, of the student uh, which was not usual uh, when when we we did it always just face to face because uh, it was quite harder uh to 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 manage uh to manage manage it okay from the challenges uh of course uh it was also uh, mentioned in the in the in the keynote speech uh, the motivation for interaction was was very hard of course if you are uh, uh, lecturing for more than 100 students always there are a few questions in the chat or something like that but uh, especially when I was teaching the Erasmus students, where there was only a few of, few of them usually, so it was quite challenging to 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 communicate with them, to uh, to force them to to interact somehow. Yeah, at least to to get the idea of what they are, they, their knowledge in in the beginning and so on. Because of course, for Eras from Erasmus uh, students, the the curricula is not a common one as as for our uh, our students uh, from my university so it's much harder to to know it, it's much more uh, vital vital to to know the uh, to get know the students so that was a challenge for me uh, also there were some technical challenges but uh, i think we can discuss them later on and uh, the next challenge was how to examine the students during the online uh, courses of course because uh, especially we deal with cheating because we, we are technical universities so students are are taught to hack things and to invent things to make them easier so uh, i i'm quite sure that they will try also to make easier the examination period so so that was a challenging thing and uh, that is technologically the hardest thing and uh, I, I, we, were, we were glad that we were somehow able to to do the examination in person in the end, although it was much more time demanding. Okay, that is all for me. I, I hope I didn't. I, I was mostly on time. Perfect. It was perfect timing. Thank you very much. Um, I have one minute sign. So if somebody is then um, oh, maybe close to 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 the end of time, then I have prepared something. But it was perfect. Thank you very much, much Shebek. And I see Oana is here, so we can uh, move back to you. So again, we have the second view now from the professor's view. So um, she's assistant professor 
uh, Joanna Rosaki, uh, the second panelist. She is from School of School of Electronical and Computer Engineering from Greece, uh, National Technical University of Athens. And Joanna, for your information, we do the plus and the minus things of the distance learning at once. So you have six minutes time. Okay. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Um... Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rakoti. Um, I'm, to be honest, I'm very happy being here uh, addressing this, this matter. Uh, I believe this was uh, the, the subject of a lot of discussions since uh, uh, COVID appeared and this pandemic. Um, I, I was thinking, I'm one of the first panelists and I should not uh, catch responses that are likely to be used by other panelists. So I was thinking, uh, all responses depend heavily on, on the population of students. So I have taught in, in students of, in, in populations of 20 students and also of a few hundreds. Um, I, I will respond with regards to the advantages, uh, specifically for very large student audiences. So uh, one of the major uh, advantages in, in distance learning settings when audiences are so, so large, a few hundreds of students, is that all students, uh, if they wish, they can take the floor. You can engage them and uh, find out their opinions via, via polls, via the Q&As, via chat. And uh, this is an excellent way. And this is really impossible when you have face-to-face uh, -face, uh, uh, lectures because how, how, how many of them? can actually uh, real time respond or orally to your questions. Uh, and raising hands and counting hands is, is, is not <laughs> equivalent to electronic polling at all, uh, I must admit. So um, for me, this is one of the major advantages that you cannot uh, find uh, an equivalent in face-to-face in, uh, -face, uh, settings. Uh, another advantage of remote education, and I'll try avoiding the ones aforementioned <laughs> by my colleague earlier on, um, has to do with uh, uh, moderating for uh, students as well as teachers that have certain uh, difficulties, let's say, um, in terms of, of uh, hearing or, or mobility. Uh, remote education, using the right tools for that, can compensate uh, the, these uh, type of, of difficulties that both teachers and, and students may have. And uh, I'm having um, feedback from uh, our students that uh, suggest, thank God that we have this pandemic now because now I can uh, attend all lectures and uh, otherwise I, I wouldn't be able to because I have some mobility difficulties and it will be impossible to, to uh, be present in, in all the, the um, courses and all the lectures. Um, now, I, I would not like to go through more uh, positive things regarding uh, remote education, distance learning. Um, I will focus on a, on a couple of, of not negative challenges that needs to be addressed in the future. Well, it, it has a, a lot of advantages and, and great opportunities, but it's undeniable that there are a lot of, uh, of weaknesses in remote education. And for me, one of the most important ones is that in cases of uh, exclusive remote education that uh, lasts for, for uh, a long time, such as this one that we are experiencing in this uh, pandemic, students, some teachers as well, start feeling too comfortable with a certain. This is one of the huge dangers. I, I see this not only with my students, I see this with my, my kids. And they're kind of reluctant to switch back to face-to-face to, uh, -face education mode. There are several reasons for that, but uh, I think this is, this is, this is not, not healthy. And uh, I think this is one of the, the uh, major uh, risks that we have to deal with. Uh, and it's, it's a risk not only from an education perspective, but also, <laughs> but also social perspective. Um, okay, I, I, I got the one minute sign. Uh, I had some issue to, to mention with regards to the negatives that there is no um, de facto standard 
that exists around so that people that are not very familiar with the technologies ha and have to switch from one platform to another, they have difficulties, especially if they are not in the ICT domain, and this is a major issue. And closing, I would like to highlight that in my humble opinion, face-to-face -face education cannot be replaced by remote education, but can very well be complemented in an excellent manner uh, if there is the right balance between the two. Thank you very much for giving me the call. Thank you very much and very well it thought uh, the right mixture uh, is the best and thank you very much for this. Um, without any further uh, time losing, I would say we move on after two professor views, if I can put it in this terms, we are now going into the a view of an online education coordinator. So the third panelist, Jose Luis Lopez Bastias, is um, from the Department of Education, Languages, Culture and Arts, and he's an online education coordinator of the Innovation in Digital Education Center. So it's quite a long department name. <laughs> yeah. <And> he's, <laughs> he is from Madrid, uh, Universidad Rey Juan Carlos. And yes, we are very interested in your two points. You have six minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the, the organizing committee and the members of this panel, and of course the audience, because I truly believe that uh, this, uh, this is going to be a really, really inspiring for all. Well, um, speaking about the, the strengths or the advantages, um, I have to say that the, the, the most important one should be the enhancement of the digitalization of the educational process. Uh, I'm speaking uh, about Rey Juan Carlos University. It was true that uh, before this pandemic time, we had some, or some degrees which were taught in an online version or in a blended version, but the vast majority of professors didn't know how to impart classes in the distance. So when this, day, this time came, um, we were pushed <laughs> to, to, to learn how to do it. And uh, I think that there is no better way of learning something than by doing it. And, and that's, uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity. And um, in, in this sense, um, relating that with uh, different strengths, I have to mention that during the time that we had to stay at home and we had to change our daily basis, um, we had a lot of, a lot of help. Uh, the online section of the university, um, the Center for Innovation and Educational uh, Department, uh, provide professors with different uh, guides, with different, with different resources, just to, for example, how to work remotely, how to prepare subjects for virtual teaching, uh, how to teach by video conferencing, how to send documents electronically. And that, and uh, apart from that, uh, there were some, some professors who were more experienced than others, who um, were the ones who teach us or taught us also how to, for example, prepare a video conference or prepare exams and so on and so forth. And it's interesting that in this context, um, there were a, a collaborative space in which uh, every, everyone could share their experiences and could share uh, the, the problems that the, the, they, they had to face. And um, now it, it, it has become a, a bank of good practices. So I, I'd like to see it as, a, as an opportunity, as a strength. And uh, now I think that um, professors are less afraid than two years ago. And we have a, a great opportunity to continue uh, advancing and we have the opportunity of absorb the best of both worlds, the face-to-face -face education on the one hand and on the other hand the distance education and that uh, should be the, the, the advantages and now I'm going to speak about the key challenges. Um, from a point of view there are two key uh, challenges. The first one should be the digital gap or the digital divide during the time uh, that we had to stay at home, although it is true that the university, our university, 
uh, did or made a, a great effort just to provide the students with, with computers, for example, uh, that digital gap points out uh, students with low incomes and students with special educational needs. They can face different barriers uh, and those barriers can limit their educational progress. And uh, on the other hand, I had to mention, as it was mentioned before, that uh, it's really necessary to uh, train teachers, professors, not only in digital competence, but also in, 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 the, in strategies and uh, methodology, methodological or teaching strategies, because it is true that we can be trained in how to prepare an exam or how to deal with the, the virtual portal, but in this new context, uh, it is ne needed a, a new approach. And um, related to, to that, I have to mention also that the educational leadership has to change. And we have now the, the strength or we have the, the a threat, the threat, and should be, for example, the, the necessity of engaged students. Uh, we are losing face-to-face -face communication, social interaction, and it is really important to provide a student with regular feedback, with uh, tutoring, uh, with uh, video conferencing, just to uh, try no, to, to do things uh, better. And that should be, the, the to sum up, the, the most important uh, threats. We have to try to commit or to try to engage our students in a different way. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I think learning by doing it is a really important phase during the uh, <laughs> pandemic. Thanks to you very much. So just one question, because it has popped up here in my view, there is a poll, um, the question to the organization, the, the, the hosts of this session. Uh, I have no opportunities to open or to see the results. Would it be possible to open the poll for the listeners? Okay, it has disappeared. I'm not quite sure if the poll has been done. I don't know. Okay. I'm not really oh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, it's visible. So I hope everybody can see it. But I, to just to go for sure, I will um, also sum it up. So the question was, which are the top three challenges for teachers in distance learning? So the three top challenges. And if I see it correctly, it was a multiple choice option. And the most votes went to keeping students interested in the course content. So again, we have also here the panelists said the motivation aspect is, is important. And also here, keeping students interested in, is on number one. Uh, the second one is make students feel included as a member of the class. Yes. So if we have the lack of face-to-face, -face, yes, this becomes important. Uh, the third one is um, the last, I think, authentic, uh, practical, and hands-on experience, so where you need really physical objects uh, like technical engineering stuff and so on. If it's missing, then of course, uh, this, this is a major part. And just to go for sure, the least uh, chosen option is reviewing group projects separately from the course online meetings uh, with 7%. And I think this summarizes up good the view of our attendees. So thank you very much. I think in between a little bit interaction as we have learned during COVID is important. And now we move forward uh, to three student views. So this is also very important to, well, basically our customers, <laughs> how have they felt during this special time uh, during distance learning. And we start with uh, Jenny uh, Jens here. She is an undergraduate uh, student from Human Resources Program. And she also the vice president at the student union. She is from Sweden, and I hope I pronounce it properly. It's Jönköping University. <laughs> so the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, um, uh, I would like to start to say that I'm coming in from the perspective more from being the vice president, because this is a full-time job. Uh, I've been working with this throughout the whole pandemic uh, for like two years now then. Uh, and Within that field, we have also worked a lot with other student unions. So I have also the perspective of Sweden students uh, as a whole and have seen uh, 
how different universities has worked with us, uh, which I would say uh, has, has really been interesting and you really see that it differs a lot. But I would like to start uh, as you others with opportunities. Um, I would say that a lot of students say that they, they really enjoy the, the content that actually is recorded and sent out. Um, we do have a lot of students that are not so good at listening and listening and writing at the same time, for example. And then when you're being able to actually redo the, the same things and go listen and, uh, and so on, it is uh, of great value to, to many students, uh, I would say. Yeah, I would also say that there is an opportunity to go to and actually start at universities that you maybe never really thought about before. Uh, when we are now in the context where, where maybe more universities actually create courses or programs that later on will be mainly on, di uh, on a digital setting, then you can actually study within another country even though you're not there. And we do have very different living costs. I mean, for example, Sweden is very high cost in comparison to a lot of other countries. And then you can actually be studying here without needing to move when, when it's actually not possible. Yeah. And you also see the, the, the less of traveling, which is a great flexibility. We talk a lot about lifelong learning in Sweden right now. And uh, we have a lot of parents that are studying and, and those groups can sometimes be forgotten within the, within the student environment, like student talks, um, because they are not within the same setting as what you maybe think about the normal students. Uh, and when they don't need to travel and when they are actually having more flexibility within the courses uh, that can increase their uh, willingness to actually study. And I think that's a really good, good thing. And it's a, it's a good way to have the work puzzle and the life, work-life balance uh, when you're studying too. Uh, I would also say that the, the more content that we're creating that is digital uh, makes it easier to actually uh, interact with the students and to get that content. Uh, for example, when you're using the polls, then you actually send out the results of them afterwards. So that the students can access them when the <laughs> now it pops up when the um, uh, when the course is over or when the when the class is over uh, and that is a great way to actually like increase the, the content which you can the, the study material. But and also I would definitely say that something I don't think that we have brought up right now is the course evaluations. Uh, it is much easier within the digital setting, or if you say you actually use the digital tools within the physical classroom to have ongoing course evaluations. Uh, you just need to have three questions pop up at the screen and you see the result right away. You can develop the, the lectures and the courses in general uh, at, right now instead of doing it after the course when, when you don't really see the results of it themselves. Um, so I would say that, that those are the main, main opportunities or like the good things uh, with the digital learning. And uh, I would definitely say that there has been uh, quite a few negative effects or challenges. And uh, one thing that we see that it's not really mentioned a lot is, uh, is the settings for the students. Uh, the work environment. You're sitting at home, uh, at least in Sweden, you are uh, often having, having uh, very small rooms. Uh, maybe you're living in 10 to 20 square meters apartments and you're studying in your bed, uh, which is definitely not a good setting uh, for learning. Uh, you don't even put on your real clothes, you're still sitting there in your pajamas. And I would definitely say that that is a, a great challenge and that's something that the, the school um, has to think about. And you also have the aspect of if you're living in an apartment with other people, well, they are maybe not studying at the same time or, thank you, uh, or you're having uh, kids or neighbors or bad internet connection, uh, which also was a little bit uh, mentioned before with uh, with um, the students' different 
um, different, like the, the, the digital gap, you would say. Uh, I would also want to emphasize that the informal, the informal conversations is some of the most important ones. And, and especially if you're moving, uh, we want to have an international uh, Europe within this field. You really need to have the, the social context for, for the students, which are definitely decreasing if you're having too much on, on a digital setting. Uh, I think I will stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm taking notes for the summary in the last, uh, and I have to write a lot. Thank you very much for all these good insights and, and experiences that you share with us. Um, I've seen again that there was a second poll about the challenges of the students. So may I ask the hosts to show the results of this? Um, again, it would be very interesting. So if you could show us the polls. Ah, yes, here they are. Thank you very much. So again, the, now we have the student perspective view. So which are the top three challenges for students in distance uh, learning? So the number one is here, stay focused and motivation, motivated to mentally show up for the class. So basically, again, uh, focusing and then motivation is, is yeah, by 85% uh, number one. Uh, number two is collaborating with other students on group uh, coursework. Yes, that's definitely something. This was at our university the same. The need that they have um, yeah, a virtual place where they can share and then work together. It's really, really important. Uh, there are lots of tools, but sometimes it's not quite easy to, to choose this, the proper one with all the security, privacy, and, and whatsoever uh, options that are available. And then on third, it's uh, getting personal guidance and feedback. Yes, yes, this is something that uh, might be challenging if the teacher is not providing it properly then it's even a more larger uh, gap than, than in the present setting. And the fourth is fitting the course in uh, with fit family home and work. And there was a Janice mentioned it. This might be from the student perspective, a difficult one. Okay, thank you very much. I close this uh, here and I would say we move on. Um, Again, a student view. So here with us, the fifth panelist, Sara Maria Setlova. Uh, she's an undergraduate student. Her focus is a uh, faculty of architecture and design. And she is from Bratislava, so Slovak University of Technology. And yeah, so the floor is yours. Please start, thank you. Thank you very much. Um... I would like to express that I agree with everything what have been said here, and I uh, don't want to repeat uh, the things. So while I was preparing for this panel discussion, a question popped in my head, and it's a really basic question. It's uh, why are we even studying? So what's the point of, of our uh, years spent uh, at the universities? So I was just think, thinking about this and how this distance learning uh, is changing our thinking. And I came to what is more important to, to get a professional education or to get a degree, a good job, or is it uh, more important to become a better human being, uh, to be ready to serve others, to create or discover beauty in this world, even in the pandemic times. And I was fondly remembering the times when we were present at school and we uh, could communicate with our teachers and peers, uh, not only in our lessons or uh, consultation hours, but uh, really naturally when we met at halls and we would chat about not just our profession and our education but about basic things that are happening in this world and uh, how are they uh, uh, changing what we think and what we create as uh, future architects or designers and I, I will say that uh, these things have the light side and the dark side as everything. And it's uh, really connected in one place. And uh, uh, I, I can, can't say that uh, 
uh, we can separate these parts. We, we can have the good ones and the bad ones together. And uh, if I should uh, focus on the good ones, that are we were forced to be creative, not just with our work, but with our lifestyles and how we come with solutions to problems and how we are trying to think in new ways to even rethink our form of education and uh, change our course to be uh, on pulse of this age and to be uh, changing as the world is changing. And with this uh, comes the bad side, the uh, really tiring side, the great pressure which can be thrust upon uh, students and I think teachers as well, and how we, we can deal with this pressure. And uh, Jenny also mentioned it, this <laughs> that um, we have to make sure that we separate our uh, life with our family or with our free time and our work life, our study time. So these uh, things uh, can't be mixed. And we, we should uh, learn how to make uh, clear boundaries between this because uh, there's great question about mental health of students and uh, how it's uh, getting worse with the pandemic and this social distancing. So the time management uh, should be great part of uh, learning at the universities. So maybe uh, like we learn how to uh, do engineering or we learn about languages or sciences, we should also learn how to, how to uh, work with our time uh, and how to separate the work stuff and uh, our own uh, personal lives. I know it's, it's connected, but it shouldn't uh, really interfere between each others. And to wrap up this, I, I would come back to my first question. It's why are we studying or uh, how distance learning can help us to be good and educated people. And uh, if I may express my opinion, uh, this can teach us to be more open, more flexible, more creative, and also more empathetic to other people with different abilities than ours, and uh, not so self-centered as we experience in uh, terms of uh, climate changes and so, so other things like this. And to sum up, I think distance, thank you, uh, distance learning uh, will be a great part of our lives and our education, but not just only part. We, we should uh, really know the importance of face-to-face -face contact and to, uh, <laughs> again, uh, learn how to look to someone in the eyes and uh, generally speak to them and communicate between each other. So that's all for me. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. And yes, very well it point again, this face to face also for the students and the, to learn that time management and that these do not, do not interfere the, the studying and working and the personal life that is still very important that a uh, young age, I'm older one, so maybe I can say it. <laughs> so we have moved uh, forward. So we are at the uh, last panelist, last but not least, Julius Paul. Uh, he's also a student, postgraduate student. Uh, his master is political science and he's from Germany, from Leibniz University, Hanover. And yes, please activate your microphone and the floor is yours, Julius. Yes, hello from Hanover. I hope you all hear me. Um, I'd like to make um, two points, basically. Um, we've heard a lot of good points, a lot of good arguments um, for and against uh, distance learning, a lot of very well made points uh, were said. Um, I'd like to think of distance learning and, and, and the whole thing that comes with this, um, not so much in positive and negative things, 
but um, I'd like to think them together, basically. So, um, firstly, I'd like to, to like to talk about putting students at the at the center of learning. That's um, what is really important to me. And secondly, I'd like to come to green higher education and sustainability. Um, so first of all, uh, Jose Luis and Jenny both mentioned it, uh, the student gap, uh, the, the, the digital gap when it comes to distance learning. Um, what is very important that you can keep the, the same level of, of studying, of learning um, that we had um, when we had face-to-face -face, um, meetings. So um, what, comes, what, what, what gets more and more important is that um, when you, for example, can't go to the library and get your books, get your texts and get your materials of studying, that you can get those materials online, um, that you can reach papers and ebooks and your materials online and then that you can use them in the same way that you would use a library, for example. So then when you're sitting at home, um, that all this is, is, is uh, accessible to you. Mm. Secondly, and uh, with that, I'd like to refer to a question in the, in the, in the question and answer section. Um, how can students be more active? And what, what from, from my perspective as a student in political science, what I realized is that the, that the discussion, the, the arguments, uh, is online, online is not the same as offline. So it's much more harder to make your point, to, to prove your argu argument right um, when you're online compared to offline. So I think um, a lot of effort needs to be made so that um, bad audio quality or, or even, even your camera visibility needs to be improved so that we don't suffer from, from this bad quality anymore when you compare it to, to offline or face-to-face -face meetings. That is what's, what's uh, really important for me. So we need to think about, about methods to, to yeah, improve that. Um, my second point, green higher education. Um, we heard it from Christina von Haaren uh, right at the beginning of the, of the workshop. Um, sustainability should lay at the heart of all actions. So we always have to keep sustainability uh, in mind uh, when we are working in the, in the uh, consortium, in the uh, U-list uh, that we established now. Um, but what does it mean to keep sustainability at the heart of all actions? First of all, distance learning requires much more effort in energy, in new buildings, when you think of uh, new computer cent uh, centers, new investments that need to be made. So sustainability should always be thought of when we, when we develop, when we invent those, those new um, means to, to keep up the level of, of studying. Uh, secondly, uh, software that use as well, like currently we are in a Zoom meeting, but on the other hand, Zoom does not publish any information on how green, how sustainable their servers are running actually. So um, sustainability at the heart of all actions needs to be really thought through at, uh, at all levels. Um, and when you think of, a, of, a, of an alliance of universities, a whole different power comes with it. So when you're a student sitting at home, you, 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 you can't really compare it to um, nine universities combining their strength and uh, eventually being able to put pressure on, on big corporate, uh, um, um, I don't know, Zoom uh, uh, um, corporates, like uh, to, to, to pressure, pressure them into um, making sustainability uh, uh, their goal as well. So that's what I, what I would highly, rec highly rec uh, recommend for the Alliance uh, when it comes to the, the sustainability goal. Um, and 
eventually uh, sustainability does not go only for for um, trees or buildings but it goes for humans as well um, when it comes to health issues or well-being issues and what I, what, ca what came to my mind is uh, the data data privacy issue uh, with zoom or with big blue button or with these streaming um, websites uh, and all so that's uh, some, uh, something um, that needs to be thought of I think um, so to to sum it up all up um, uh, what's really really important for me is the 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 power that goes with uh, with this alliance of you list um, to to really go forward in distance learning but also in sustainability and to make it green change maybe thank you So thank you very much. We are absolutely on time. So a big, big thank you for all the panelists. We are really on time here. So in the meantime, I was trying to uh, do and summarize the questions in parallel. And I've also got an email probably uh, with the questions. But what I have seen, La, thank you very much, uh, Julius, for answering one of the questions here this about the, the motivation and interaction. So what would be interesting here, because uh, here in the, the questions and the answers panel, we have also the questions included from the previous session, but I think some of them are maybe relevant here as well. So the question is, how can we make students more active in distance learning? So we have heard a little bit about the student perspective. I would uh, raise this question or pass this question to the teachers. So maybe, um, I would go to Diana and um, ask you to, to answer this one. Thank you very much. Ah, this is a very interesting question. It's very tricky. Um, I, I personally teach in, in uh, very young students of the first and second year, and it's always challenging, even, even in, in uh, face to face settings, to engage them. Because if they're not engaged, they get bored and sleepy and, and they don't get a hint of what you're talking about. So in the previous semester, um, I, I, I tried using slides. I usually do not use slides in, in young students. So I, I use the whiteboard or the blackboard, but this was not very convenient in, in uh, remote education. So it, it was rather a failure from my behalf in the last, uh, 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 in, the, in the previous year, in the, the um, spring semester of 2020. So I decided to, to buy some digitizer, to be honest. Uh, and this substitutes excellently the, the whiteboard that uh, is in the amphitheaters. And this way I managed to engage uh, a very high percentage of my students, uh, asking questions, what, what should go next? And uh, these, a lot of them answering, uh, answering me in the, in the chat privately. Uh, I managed to get, for example, 50 answers from the audience. Well, in face-to-face in -face settings, it would be a couple of, of students raising hands and taking the floor. Uh, and this was, uh, I, I think this was a personal win uh, this year from my side. And I 100% I vote for good digitizers to be, to be used from teachers, uh, especially when they, they uh, teach a uh, large audience and, and young uh, students. Uh, other means of uh, student engagement are uh, polls to keep them interested. And uh, the Q and A's are, are also a good thing, but uh, I would vote for a polls and uh, digitizer substituting the, the whiteboard users. That's, that's where I stand, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like now to answer the question uh, that went to the students in basically uh, uh, focusing on how um, if the meeting deadlines during distance learning are they becoming uh, more challenging due to the extra workload that you already have so it, I guess uh, these deadlines are, are more and more uh, difficult or because the time flexibility and that you save time by traveling maybe it has also a little bit eased up the situation so maybe here a short question a short answer from from you maybe starting uh, with sarah 
Yes, uh, I think I know partly the answer to this. Um, my uh, school or my faculty is known to be quite hard on students uh, with a uh, lot of uh, deadlines. And uh, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, uh, there is time spared because we uh, don't need to commute and uh, transfer from different places. But I hadn't felt this way. I think um, teachers might thought that we have free time, but the time we had, we needed to recover from long uh, hours uh, of online lectures. And uh, sitting behind the screen, uh, it doesn't look tiring, but it really is because I felt on myself that uh, when I have a lecture face to face, I can focus on him or her. Uh, and uh, I, I easily understand what they say and easily remember this. But looking at the screen and slides showing, it's not, not so easy. And I, I'm going back to the question, uh, doing uh, exercises or working on projects, this, uh, these online semesters, were were harder and uh, it was really pressing and I think uh, the face-to-face -face contact uh, would help us to cooperate and this on, the, on these things because when we sit alone in our rooms it's hard to reach out to our peers or other students and maybe ask for help or to do some projects together. Uh, it was easier at the university where we sit together and we chat and we can done this easily. So I think uh, the face-to-face -face learning would be better in this matter. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, maybe uh, Julius, your view on this point, um, what do you think from your perspective? Yes, um, so personally, um... I must say, I really miss face-to-face uh, -face classes. And um, I'm quite lucky that I'm not too, too much pressured into finishing studying at a certain date or, or something. So I, I, what I did during Corona is I, I did the bare minimum of what I needed to do. And I really was looking, or I'm still looking forward to um, going back to face-to-face discussions and, and, and seminars, because from my point of view, it's, it's quite different in humanities. Um, making your point, proving your argument is, is something completely different online from offline. Um, but that, that's only one thing. Uh, the other side is um, speaking to people about the, the uh, um, course uh, afterwards or before the course. Um, is, is is very vital for for the whole for the whole studying process so you don't you don't have this online um going for lunch or going for a drink after the seminar with uh fellow students and that's something that really is important to me Okay, thank you very much. And yes, very valid points here. So maybe the same questions to Jenny because this covered all students. So from your point of view, as you have mentioned, you you have here um, uh, you are the vice president of the student union, and you have here maybe a little bit more insights about the majority of students. What do you uh, know in, in in respect to this topic and this question? Yeah, I would say that it definitely differs a lot. We have we have seen where professors are transforming a norm, if you have an, a regular exam in a hall, for example, transforming that into a digital setting where they are at home and then decreasing the time, for example, because, well, then, you know, then you can't uh, cheat on it, uh, which definitely puts a lot of stress and especially on those students that feel that, well, I need my time not to cheat that is not the, not the problem here. It's to read and actually understand a question and to write and put it on paper. Uh, and in those cases, definitely has, uh, how do you say, increased the stress levels. On the other hand, we have also seen a lot of 
teachers who have embraced the, the digital setting and more using the open book kind of exam, where you are given several days to complete the test, which then makes you more able to focus, to more put on the time, uh, more flexibility in regards to the time settings. If you're a morning person, you do the studies in the morning and then you're actually free in the, in the evenings, for example, and, and are giving more time. And then that is making the testing, uh, the exam actually become much better. So we see both of the sides. Um, and I wouldn't really say that I could say any, well, generally this is the more or this is less. Uh, because it's also depending on what topics we have seen that math, for example, has been either it's been a lot of cheating or it's been uh, on campus, uh, honestly. And that is um, that has then uh, rather become more on campus based. Um, but definitely it's needed to be the testing of the student's knowledge needs to be adapted to the current situation. And then you, you cannot just copy it and, and shorten the time. Yeah, thank you very much. This is a valid key point, cheating and examination. This was massive also at our university. Of course, um, the view of two, uh, teachers and students. And I would um, raise this question. There is this is connected here. In what ways should teachers adopt their examination style, taking into account that the students have more access to educational materials when examined at home? So they have now... A, vast, uh, how should I say, access to materials. And I would here address this uh, to teachers. And uh, maybe, Zbigniew, can you answer it from your perspective? OK, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we were thinking a lot of about a lot about it uh, at our faculty. And, uh, you know, like I see for, for this approach, when uh, you give more times to students to to uh, to do the examination, to do the let's say to answer the question, uh, it, it you can you can make the question harder. You can make it more let's say open. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, the question is, uh, will be uh, will the student uh, do it by himself? Yeah wouldn't be there any any um let's say um cooperation with with some, somebody else yeah that that is that is what we were let's say afraid of so that is that is big con uh we were we, we prepared some solutions like for example that uh, during the examination uh there will be a camera that will see the student so so we know that he's all only working on 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 the on the answers we don't and he's not communicating with anybody else and something like that but uh, in in the end it's almost as as time consuming for for the for the teachers uh, as the oral, oral exam and of course, if uh, we would like to to have courses with several hundred students, so that's uh, that's uh, almost that is impossible <laughs> to do. Uh, so, uh, so for big courses, of course, the, uh, the we, we need to have tests. And um, thanks to the to the to the to the situation in Czech Republic, it was possible to do the exams for uh, small groups of students so we have a, a really big number of really small uh, group of students and we did the examination uh, in person uh, uh, but uh, we for example the the midterm tests were usually online so the, my approach was that we decrease the number of questions and we make them more open uh, but we also a little bit decreases the time so uh, at least elementary things has to be let's say known by the student so he has no not enough time to to learn anything from the scratch but uh, it was uh, uh, not enough time to to reinvent the solution with other colleagues let's say and i think it worked uh, and in general uh, the, the the results like the yeah the results were very similar to the to the to the results of, of the midterm exams from previous years yeah so that's uh, that's my 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 view thank you yeah thank you very much and i 
completely agree here the amount of students is a key issue when when doing these examinations and the possibilities that you can use so i would um raise the same question to you as well uh, jose luis so maybe your insights at your university towards examinations and the difficulties with it and, and those are the opportunities yes in the case of Rey juan carlos university um final exams were presential uh, face to face and the rest of the, the semester was uh, online. So from a point of view, what I did was uh, I prepared the, my subject just to uh, and, uh, pay in special attention to other kind of evaluation different from the, the final test. Um, my, my subject, uh, one of the subjects was attention to diversity. And in that subject, we had a, a great opportunity to debate, a great opportunity to, uh, pay, to work on, on, on different projects and in different cases. And um, from a point of view, the exam is, uh, is a part of the evaluation, but it's not the, the, main, the main part. So when we uh, came to the, to the final, part of the semester, the, evalu the, the exam uh, is, was like the 20% of the final, uh, the final uh, degree. So in, in this sense, um, I, I think that we now in this context, we, have, we, we cannot think or the same, as the same way as we thought before, and we cannot translate the, 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 the things that, that uh, were done during the, the, the presidential mode of face-to-face -face, uh, education to this year, which has been uh, different. So methodologies should, should change too in, in, in this sense. That's what I, I really believe. Yes, thank you much, and I can share your, your experiences here as well. I see, Joanna, you have uh, raised your hand. Please go on. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Virgo. Uh, it was very challenging because I, as I said, I didn't hear um, Excuse me to interrupt you, but we hear your voice double, so it's a loop somewhere. Yeah, yeah. is it uh, fixed now? Is it fixed now? I believe it is. Yes, yes, it's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I, I teach in very large student populations, and I teach in the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering, so it is very easy for them, for students to, to somehow not act very properly, very appropriately when, when they're being examined. So it was uh, very challenging for teachers to come up with very personalized, let's say, sets of uh, exam questions. So rather than uh, producing a set of 10 uh, questions, we had to produce a, a set of 300 questions randomly selected for each student. And we, we, we tried to, to um, uh, after some te tests we did, we did with our uh, PhD students, to select the right time for them to, to give and uh, so that they are answered uh, just in time and, and they don't have any extra time. The results, uh, I think they justified us because the percentage of success was very similar to uh, the ones in, in previous years. So I believe we did the, the right thing, but it was really, really very time consuming from, from, for teachers to come up, well, uh, 20 times higher population of questions and very diverging questions. But uh, I, I hope, well, we did our best and I believe our students did our best <laughs> as well. And uh, well, I, I completely agree with, uh, uh, both uh, speakers that address this is one of the great challenges that we have to face in, in remote education exams. exams. Thank you. Yeah, thank you much. I um, can absolutely relate to that. I mean, the e-learning stuff, and this was a very often raised question. That, uh, how many questions do I need? What it, if it's leaked and so on and so on. So it's really a difficult one and a lot of, lot of, lot of work and um, writing good questions is a tough one. So there is one very interesting question for the audience. It's, it's targeting both students and um, 
teachers. And the question is, um, how important is to for you, for your role, to activate the cameras in online lectures? So I would do it maybe in a sort of interactive way. So if you think it is important, then do this. And you say, ah, it's in the middle one, then do like this one. And if you say it's not important, then do like this one. And I would start with uh, students. So Jenny, uh, Sarah, and Julius, what do you think? How important is for students uh, to activate the cameras in online lectures? So please. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So it's important for the students. <laughs> thank you. Um, if you move or change to the, the teachers or the admin administrative staff. So here, Zibek, um, Jose Luis and Joanna, what do you say? Ah, it's difficult to see Jose, I think. Ah, okay, it's thumb up. Okay, I see. <laughs> Thank you. And maybe if I can uh, also give my vote here, it's also like between this and this. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. We we are, uh, yeah, we have four minutes left. I, let me just skim through the questions if I have missed something. Oh, okay, here is one question. Has the transition to distance learning uh, had a different impact on the quality of engineering and natural sciences courses or humanities of arts? Uh, I think here humanities and arts, this was uh, going to you, Jose Luis, if I can ask you to, to answer this question from the audience. Can you repeat the, the question, please? Yes, yes. Has the transition to distance learning had a different impact uh, on the quality of engineering and natural sciences courses? Okay, well, in, in, in my case, although I'm part of the, the department uh, which uh, is in charge of humanities and uh, uh, culture, I'm more into the educational science. So, well, for me, it, it, uh, it was quite easier. But other colleagues that I, I have uh, for them was really difficult to, for example, uh, those who were to work in architecture and arts, like, for example, doing sculptures and, and, and things like that. For them, uh, in, in subjects or in degrees which are more uh, practical, uh, it's, it's a, a problem that they had. And in this case, the, the university uh, provide uh, professors with different uh, structures, but uh, paying special attention to the, the, the COVID measures. And uh, the, the experience was, was positive in that, in, in, that, in that sense. But for them were really, really difficult to adapt that part to an online or on a distance uh, basis. Yeah, thank you very much. And one thing that I maybe um, add here from my point of view, so basically uh, at my university, we have also um, um, teachers who are external teachers who are just here for all the lectures for one, two hours and for them to completely change uh, the, the, to, the, to the new ways, even do not really knowing the, 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 the university perfectly and all the service units and all the, the possibilities, it was sometimes uh, difficult to get the answer from. So get the, um, the information from each um, units that are responsible, for example, for the web conferencing systems or for the e-learning platforms that they are, get answers there. So it was not really connected to the topics they are teaching, um, but general access to, to the guidelines and, and uh, options. Okay, uh, yes, I see the information. Um, yeah, that we are at the end of the session. Oh, perfect. It's um, uh, already time for the break. And I think we should take the break now. It was very, very intense, but a lots of lots of insights. And I have uh, now difficulty to sum it up, <laughs> all these good, good points and to uh, summarize it. And I've got the information that uh, we have to uh, move the panelists away and the moderators to to the different uh, webinar rooms. So, okay, that's just information for us. So thank you very much for all the panelists here for all the great inputs and insights. Thank you very much. And also for the listeners, uh, all for the questions and the answerings. And yeah, it was a really vivid discussion and it was great. Thank you very much. And now let's have a little break. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I think we have reached the final session of this uh, distant learning workshop. Um, in all the panel, in all the panels, they were extremely, um, how can I say, constructive. Uh, this and that with the great interaction of the audience. Uh, what I would like to say uh, and to update you, if we want, if we would like to describe this workshop in numbers, we had approximately 300 attendees who attended the workshop in its whole duration. 140 participants participated in the different pollings that appeared at different stages of this uh, workshop. And we had 58 questions posed by the attendees of the audience. So um, that's these KPIs indicate that uh, one of the object objectives of this distance learning workshop to have all the attendees interact in a way it was achieved. At that section, I would like to invite the moderators of the three different panels to present to us the key points discussed and summarized in, in every and each of the three panels. I would like to start with Professor Julia Gillen from the Leibniz University of Anovero, who was the moderator of panel number one. Julia, the floor is yours. <laughs> yes, thank you, Katerina. Um, we had a very, um, yeah, very um, constructive and um, yeah, a very, very good session. And we had some um, aspects we um, came again over and over. But uh, first, I, I want to give a, you a, a short conclusion. One of the, yeah, the the one of the good effect we have is the internationalization of teaching so it's now it's very easy to engage lecturers from abroad and to bring them bring guest lecturers in our universities even um, if they are not in your in our countries and uh, our cities so we can we have a very good opportunity to collaborate uh, with partner universities um, all over the world and in Europe. So that was one of the points we heard. Uh, one of the um, pros was also that uh, we now we have to have the opportunity or we use the opportunity to, to record the lectures for, for our, our students and to record the lectures even uh, for other lecturers and to collaborate uh, lecture by lecture together. So that was a one of the pros and one of the yeah challenges we discussed um, in some sometimes uh, is to um, have the exams and to the assessments in the online models. It's very it's not we we don't have the best ways already. Um, so perhaps we have to look for more oral exams, more project orientated exams and to uh, come to uh, continuous uh, continual uh, assessment and not to have one of one summary uh, this, um, assessment um, so and and the students um, they they said very clear that the flexibility and time and place was one of the best effects of the remote models but one of the yeah biggest um, challenge was the lack of interaction and even the social interaction they didn't had in uh, in the remote models so in summary um we you can say the that the new discourse on teaching and studying we have in the universities for a long time um give us a great opportunity for improvement of teaching and study uh, student experience. And um, that was something we saw in all of the universities who take part in the discussion. Okay, so I, I stop here and perhaps uh, the others will continue. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you very much indeed. I would like now to invite Professor Andre Rizavi from the Brown University to summarize um, the discussions held in panel number two. Andre, 
the screen is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And I will also use my screen. Uh, I put there some points, some significant points that uh, outcomes from our discussion. So the first is about the opportunities and uh, the opinion of the speakers were that uh, it definitely boosts some collaboration and uh, also the speed of innovations. So a lot of things that weren't taken waited for some impulse to deal with were now possible and uh, even required. So the collaboration, the intensive collaboration between the institutions and also boosting some kind of innovations in terms of distance learning and also using more online platforms for communicating, doing online meetings, etc. Uh, was uh, something that uh, this distance learning period brings us advantage. Also, uh, especially teachers expressed that uh, they actually they were forced to familiar uh, familiar themselves to new tools, which may prove them useful. So they started to use uh, different tools available on the market and realized that they can also boost some productivity. And the necessary digitalization removes some paperwork. So not everything uh, had to be printed on the paper. And it was uh, appeared in this uh, distance learning period where it was not possible to print the paper, sign it, uh, and so on. Also more activities that were traditionally did uh, in person were now as uh, online activities, especially exams. So exams were traditionally considered as a thing that you need to come to the university, you are controlled by some supervisor and you need to do exam in person. Now uh, it uh, was possible to do online exams, of course, in a different uh, shape. Uh, there were also some demand for new features of distance learning tools because more people start using them. And uh, I guess that what was the most considered or most discussed point or opinion that uh, it increased uh, flexibility because now you don't need to or in this period you don't you don't have to uh, move physically to some other location which also takes some time so you are more flexible if you have online lectures you can uh, watch them from your home or even when you travel so the flexibility was something that was very appreciated uh, during this uh, period and uh, with the flexibility, there was also opinion that it is possible to do more work and uh, also to even take more classes than before, which is true, but as you will see on the next slide is flexibility and doing more has also some drawbacks. And uh, finally, what was very appreciated by students, especially was that uh, availability of recorded lectures. So, uh, I thought that uh, students uh, would appreciate some maybe other things like uh, some more interesting and more advanced tool for delivering the content, but it appears that have access to recorded lecture to be able to uh, replay it again in an order to understand the more the specific things in this lecture is uh, something that is very appreciated by, by students. So that was uh, some advantages, and this is the list of the possible risks and challenges. So definitely the social dimension, including uh, the feeling of isolation is the biggest problem, not only for the students, but of course for the entire society. Uh, also, there was uh, some opinion that uh, even there's some innovation, so something had to be done and move uh, and innovate then uh, Sometimes you may feel that you lose control over this innovation and over the evolution of the environment because you cannot see the environment, you cannot touch, you cannot be part of this environment because it's kind of virtual environment. And uh, sometimes you may feel that this virtual environment uh, is somehow moving out, uh, from you away and, and you are losing the control. Also, it includes that the entire system and entire education and distance learning at this time was uh, less structured and it was kind of difficult to orient. Uh, there were complications uh, in interaction between teacher and student. Uh, some teachers uh, may lack 
necessary pedagogical skills in order to deliver uh, the lectures online. And there may, of course, be some technological problems. On the other side, uh, teachers may have problem with monitoring student progress uh, to prepare some uh, suitable tests in order to evaluate them uh, and the things related to the student's assessment. And also the biggest problem that both teachers and students agree on was uh, the lack of hands-on exercises or hands-on labs. So for some uh, areas of education or for most of them, it is necessary to also have some practical uh, experience in a labs. So without the labs, uh, the education was quite difficult. And uh, students also complained that uh, there are a lot of tools that they had to use because it uh, usually depends on the choice of the teacher. So some of them use uh, like Microsoft Teams, Google, or some other tools. So uh, if you as a student need to learn all of these tools, sometimes it may be quite difficult. And also sitting and doing all lectures online are quite complicated for students to stay focused. And as I said, the one advantage of this distance link period was uh, increased flexibility. It is at the same time as the disadvantage or some uh, drawback of this, because if you have too much flexibility, it may be difficult to, let's say, set deadlines or to organize your time in order to uh, complete all things you want to do. So, uh, the flexibility is in both uh, categories. Uh, so this is what I uh, recorded uh, from the discussion. And uh, I will pass uh, uh, my screen to some other moderator. Thank you very much, Andre, for this uh, very structured summary and wrap up that really helps us to identify all the key points discussed by both academics and students. And I would like now to invite the moderator of the third panel, uh, Dr. Geger Lira uh, from the Technical University of Vienna to present uh, to all of us uh, the key points discussed in panel number three. Geger the screen is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, before I start with summarizing up, uh, just one note, Jenny, she will uh, talk after me. She will focus on the students group. She was also mm -hmm. in the third panel and we have had a short Zoom session in between to, yeah, not to talk the same <laughs> that we split up our uh, summarize, summaries. So let's start with the teachers or administ administrative staff uh, points. So I would like to start with the yeah, opportunity strengths and the positive ones. So basically, if you have, for example, large number of, of students, uh, the fast response that you get as a teacher, if you apply it correctly, this is really, really good. You have real time response, a lot of students, whether via polls or the chat uh, comments, if you activate the students properly, you can get really fast, really good feedback. Also the access, for example, for students, for guests uh, um, is, is easier. So, for example, um, getting uh, students from other countries included in your courses, for example, is much better. So mobility um, advantages uh, are there as well. Also, accessibility is, is one. Uh, if you are, for example, not it's not easy for you to travel, then here again, you have a, a large benefit. And also, you can take more classes because changing between classes is you don't need to walk between, for example, class, uh, lecture halls. You can just click three times and you have a new Zoom session with a different course. So it's, it's also a benefit. And one of the panelists said that uh, it's really interesting outcome that, for example, there are some professors who are now after this transition are less afraid of technology and now the digitalization boost is also so better so uh, they won't go back and we'll probably have a blended scenario where, where both um, worlds the the real world and the virtual world um, benefit from each other yeah and basically now i would like to switch to the uh, difficulties the challenges uh, that we have discussed it was an intense discussion with a lot of questions and uh, thank you very much for all the people and panelists and attendees it was really really good uh the digital gap of course is is one um yeah 
key issue. It was a key issue and is still remaining one. So those having less competencies in, in, in handling e-learning tools and, and, and digital tools, yeah, and it's more clearly now. It's simply one, one, one big point here. Also, basically, those who are maybe having special needs uh, or, or are low income or have to uh, yeah, deal with, for example, less infrastructure in terms of bandwidth or, or less room, less physical uh, uh, possibilities, then the new world is completely, uh, the new normal is completely difficult. Also, keep up with work-life balance if the your office is your uh, living room as well. I think I see a lot of head nodding. Yeah, it is a difficult, difficult thing. So sometimes the, the changing of, of rooms going to the university is really relieving. And one point that was a really a huge issue at our university as well, uh, the examination in terms of, yeah, cheating, privacy, security uh, aspects. It, it's huge. And it was really good to hear that also other universities uh, have struggled a little bit, but found some solutions that might work. Maybe we have to develop a little bit new approaches, but um, this is really one that it's not solved 100%. We have to work on that. And as Adolf uh, summarized before, yeah, the face to face collaboration and communication is really good. And in, ready, uh, of, in, in lots of teaching scenarios, it's still the best. In Zoom, speaking parallelly, uh, simultaneously is not possible. And in other settings, it is uh, possible. And yeah. This was one one point, and uh, yeah, the last thing which with which I want to close is we are not allowed to forget that one hour online teaching for students and also for teachers is really demanding, and sometimes more demanding than in a classroom or in a physical setting. Yes, that was from my part. My part, and then give back to you, Katrina. Thank you very very much, Kegeli, and uh, we would like to invite now Jenny from the university. Uh, allow me to, to pronounce properly uh, from the University of Jen Shepping uh, to, to provide to us uh, the view of the students, uh, given her role as well as a vice president uh, of the students of her university. So Jenny, we would like very much to have uh, the perspective of students clearly stated uh, uh, by you. Yes, I will give you the correct answer then. Uh, <laughs> we would uh, from the discussions that we have had uh, to start with what's what's been good what's uh, what's the benefit it's one of them is definitely the accessibility of all the different documents uh, and as we said before the recorded lectures they are of great value for the students and in that sense you have been a little bit forced to use more of the digital library which then you realize how much bigger it actually is and how much more material that is accessible. We were also talking a little bit about the, the question, why are we studying? Uh, and to always bring that question back to uh, back to ourselves. Oh, <laughs> back to ourselves when we are uh, in the in the school. And a little bit of a conclusion of that is what we hope is that become a better, better person and to actually use what we're learning to create a better world uh, and to not forget about that when we are in this digital setting. And now you're making some sound. I'm sorry, Katharina. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, the digital tools that can be used both on campus and when you're in the digital learning se se um, uh, setting where you can do more of the course evaluations ongoingly, you can just pop up these polls and, uh, and get the feedback more frequently. It doesn't have to be a, uh, a hard way and you can actually use the feedback within the course ongo like ongoingly. Then when we come to the more challenges, uh, of course, all these social, um, social parts and the, informal conversations are very important for the students and both student to student and student to teacher. Uh, those kind of conversation has unfortunately disappeared and can, 
is, is very valuable for the learning experience, for the discussions uh, after the class when you're meeting up and just working on your arguments for your sake or working on your, your um, learnings by listening to others. So that is something that definitely is, um, is lacking when we are in these sessions, uh, settings and you have the facial expressions and the sound and the video does affect it a lot. Uh, so those are some, <laughs> some great challenges to work with. Uh, and then we also come in with aspects of your uh, financial situation, if you actually can afford to, to buy the greatest computer to actually have the right tools for it. Um, and that brings us into the work environment in general. Uh, you said when, the <laughs> when your living room is your office, well, for most students, it's your bedroom. Uh, and it's your bed. Uh, and that work environment is definitely not to benefit the, the study uh, for the students. And that is something that uh, really needs to be considered when we are locking down the campuses and when we are not even able to, to do the, the studies in a proper seating. Uh, and then you always also have the student accommodations, maybe you're sharing your room with others or you're sharing your apartment with others uh, you have your kids if you're a parent um, those settings are extremely uh, hard and you, it's also time consuming to work with these uh, life work-life balance uh, and then it's also time management within that um, to you know wiggle all these balls or how to say um, and it's also some, something that, that definitely affects the students is that once you get inactive, when you're not active within your learning, uh, it's harder to actually interact more. Uh, and that we have heard from teachers that they are having a struggle to make the students active. Well, once you get more inactive, it is harder to, to actually get there again. Um, and we also wanted to lift the environmental aspect of this, uh, both on the tools that we're using, but then also to end, wrap this up with the, the opportunities that we as a universities and we as collaboration, um, universities with collaboration, that we can actually make a great impact. We can push both towards companies and towards our governments to actually make a greater uh, greater impact on, on the positive sides of the environmental. So that's something that uh, also comes with this and especially when we're collaborating like this. Uh, I hope that I got our different aspects uh, of this. Um, so I will uh, leave it back to you, Katarina. Uh, Jenny, thank you very, very much because uh, really all the issues you summarized were issues discussed in all the panels, more or less. And one of the issues all of you, the students, panelists raised was the lack of boundaries between private and, um, and uh, work, and which I thought it was a problem that we uh, professionals and teachers have, because really <laughs> there is no boundary any longer. And it seems that applies to, to the students as well. And I found this exceptionally interesting. Thank you very much, Jenny, really, uh, for all this. And um, I would like uh, to check, because we have a number of polls that went on, um, most possibly you've noticed it during the whole duration of the workshop. Uh, the questions were popping up and down. As I said, more than 150 people provided their views in these pollings. So I would like to ask my colleagues here at NTUA if we are ready to present the summary of these polls, because then we would like to invite uh, Professor Monica Bakosova to summarize the next steps. But before Monica starts, thank you very much, Jenny. I would like to ask whether we are going to present um, the polling results uh, or we can just upload it into the website. Give me one second to see if we're going to have any results. Thank you very much. And, and something else I'd like to remind to everybody is uh, uh, attendees that would, uh, are interested in, uh, in acquiring a certificate of attendance, please uh, say, uh, state so at the, at the website. Um, so I don't see, uh, I don't see, Thank you. 
Uh, let me wait. Let's give another second to the technical. Uh, okay, uh, I see that there is a delay. So I would like to invite Professor Monica uh, Bakosova from uh, uh, the Technology University of Bratislava uh, to give her, to give us her views and um, regarding the next steps regarding distance learning. And Monica, the floor is yours. Thank you, Katerina, and uh, thank you also for the opportunity to formulate uh, next uh, steps. I will try to share my screen. Uh, I hope. Um... Uh, can you see my screen, please? Yes, 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 Monica, yes. we can see very so, well. Uh, I tried to formulate the uh, next steps in distance learning based on uh, the keynote lecture and also the discussion in the panel one. So I think that the main message of uh, this workshop on distance learning that it is necessary to develop and to use distance learning also in the future. And uh, it is necessary also to reinvent face-to-face uh, -face learning to greater value. And now to individual steps. Uh, the first step uh, in, for the future is uh, to create strategy and strategic plan for distance learning at the universities because during the pandemic situation uh, we started distance learning uh, without any strategy yes then uh, it is necessary also to choose proper platforms and learning management systems for distance learning not only in the frame of the university but also for the cooperation between universities maybe um, uh, in our alliance of universities uh, then it is also necessary to create effective online or blended courses again at individual universities in collaboration with universities because we can share our um, knowledge and experiences and also for collaboration between universities because we can share the prepared online courses and uh, the effective online and blended courses are all are, are and will be also very important for a realization of uh, mobilities. Uh, so to the next steps, um, mm, we can add also creating uh, attractive videos uh, for synchronous or asynchronous teaching. And what is uh, important for the future to bring in distance learning experts and guest speakers from not only academia and other universities, but also from science and uh, industry. And it is um, the good feature of uh, distance learning that it is very simple to bring these experts into teaching and uh, learning. But then the, uh, other, uh, the other step is to choose uh, proper tools for developing practical skills. So it is recommended to create more remote laboratories to use virtual reality, uh, Internet of Things, digital twins and other advanced uh, information and communication technology because uh, it is very hard to develop uh, practical skills um, uh, using distance learning. Uh, and then um, it is also necessary to choose and use proper tools for attracting attention of students during online teaching because it is not so easy to attract attention of students, for example, during the lecture taking one or more hours. And again, it is also necessary to choose and use the proper tools for exams. Uh, for example, it is necessary to, uh, to the proper electronic um, uh, 
software for examining proctoring software or to use other form of exams as for example projects and etc and uh, it is also important in the future to develop systematically competencies of teachers such as technology skills, software skills, digital skills, pedagogical competencies, open mindedness, etc. Up to now, it was more randomly than systematically developed. And it is also important to increase support from uh, the universities for teachers as well as students. And it is technical support, software support, instruction videos, software tutorials, pedag pedag pedagogical training. Thank you very much. Uh, it is everything for me. And the screen is again yours, Katerina. Monica. Uh Really, we would like to thank you very much because uh, you and all the moderators and the representative of the students managed in a very, very short period of time really to summarize and wrap up what it was discussed during the last three hours. Before we close, I would like in agreement to everything you, you said or, or all of you uh, to give you the most popular answer in the pollings that run during this workshop one question for the teachers and one question for the students. When the teachers were requested, which are the top three challenges for, this, for teachers in distance learning, the most popular answer by 80% was keeping students interested in the course content. And me as, as, a, as, as a teacher, I would absolutely agree that this is the greatest challenge. The second most, most popular was make students feel included as a member of the class. In very in, in harmony with the response of the teachers, the students responded by eight, by 91% that staying focused and motivated to mentally show up for class was the key challenge for them. The second and third, collaborating with other students on group coursework and fitting the course in with family home work responsibilities. So it seems that there is an overall agreement towards the, the most important opportunities and challenges at the same time. And all the results I think we discussed during this workshop today, all of them pinpoint of how important it is to organize these university alliances. And everybody mentioned, both teachers and students, how much they enjoy this flexibility, this ability to work together with colleagues from other countries, from other campuses, and students mentioned that regarding how easier it is now. Of course, always underlying the importance of face-to-face -face cooperation. Having said that, I think that um, we reached the conclusion of this workshop. I think that uh, the objectives of this workshop were achieved to the highest possible degree. Uh, I would like to invite the director of NTUA to close the event and ask all of you to stay with your cameras open all the panelists, all the moderators, uh, and all the speakers, so we can take uh, a group picture uh, for this event, which was the first, uh, if you want, uh, organized event of our University Alliance, and we hope it's going to pave the way. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Budovis, uh, I would like to invite you. Uh, thank you for uh, your participation, all of you, especially the students, and for sharing thoughts, concerns, and experience. Some of them very subtle, Jenny. And for your contribution in making the new normal in uh, distance learning, less of a shadow and more of a reality. Uh, we at NTUA tried our best and we are really happy with the outcome of this workshop. Uh, I'm optimistic that uh, time is coming that distance learning will not be a necessity, but a choice. And the new normal will be a much better normal. Until then, let's get over with vaccination, fix our summer vacation plans, and be prepared, but certainly not fully relaxed for the next academic year. Uh, dear Alliance members, uh, let's plan ahead in accordance to our motto, 
European universities linking society and technology. Remote teaching and interaction is at the heart of university alliances. Uh, public events like uh, today's event, although demanding, certainly help a lot to this direction. And as a matter of fact, such virtual events might remain a preferred choice in the new normal. Goodbye from NTUA. Greece is already in a summer mood and very inviting for that purpose. Stay safe, stay healthy, be connected and have a nice day. Thank you very much, everybody. All of the colleagues from all the North, South, East and Western of European Union. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.